Welcome to Mafia, a new podcast telling stories of America's criminal underworld. Gotti assumed the position of head of the Gambino family. And using the name Donnie Brasco, I was able to infiltrate the uh, Bonanno uh, crime family in New York City. Bugsy Siegel is an American mob legend. One man changed the whole texture and landscape of crime in America. Listen to Mafia every Wednesday on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite shows. But oh no, he comes back and now she's caught and she's screaming and he's going to table saw her face off? Is yeah. that this is the most efficient A, yeah. a man who murderer. was just holding a hunting knife yeah, right. two <laughs> seconds ago is like, I think I'm going to go with table saw. We're in his murder shed. <laughs> We're in his evil murder what shed. About the best what about a lathe? What about a lathe? What if I smooth her face a little bit a like jigsaw. an ellipse? <laughs> Will you mind lying across this thing and I'm just going to slowly push you forward into this? <laughs> God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because it's the only thing Eli doesn't masturbate to. I'm oh, your bullshit. host, Noah Leesons, and sitting to my immediate left is my good friend, Heath Enright. Heath, welcome back. See, this is what happens when you underuse the boss. This is the garbage <laughs> you get. <laughs> Not at all true to the originals. Very disappointed. And sitting 989 miles to my right is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? Look, I don't know who started the rumor that I don't jerk off to these movies, but that is not true. <laughs> yeah. Especially. <laughs> Especially this movie. Every time Kevin Sorbo was on screen, just... <laughs> Let's quash that quick, huh? <laughs> Just thinking about it, I just busted one out. And sitting to the immediate right of his own left is the nearly up for parole Thomas Smith of Comedy Shoeshine and Atheistically Speaking fame. Thomas, welcome back. Oh, thank you, thank you. You know, I looked it up, and I, I'm sorry to break it to you guys, but according to California law, I actually own part of your podcast now. <laughs> you, you're not, you actually can't evict me. If I just sit here on your podcast, you can't get rid of me. I see. So, right, it's next like, week's movie, you'll scare him off. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I think we'll get rid of you quicker than you know. Also, I, I think my, sorry if there's a bit of an echo, but it, it's my Christian movie health problems have only gotten worse, but the, I couldn't find the right mic for this iron line lung that I'm in. It might sound a little <laughs> little weird in here, but yeah, my skin is like 80% gone. People don't know this, I'm a mess. Putin actually just gave that reporter Christian movies. He didn't actually <laughs> put uranium in his water. He was just like, here, check it the- out. Revolution Road 2. David A.R. <laughs> White filmography for you. So, Obviously, we've already kind of spilled the beans, but Heath, tell us, what will we be breaking down today? All right. We watched... R- Revelation Road 3, the Black Rider Revelation Road the 3 part. Um, they couldn't really figure uh, that yeah. out. Could Apparently, they? they had a serious fight about the title, and this was the <laughs> awful compromise they landed on. Yeah, I had the same note. I had, finally, we get to the Revelation Road movie in the Black Rider series. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. This is the Donald Trump of movie titles. They had some trouble deciding. <laughs> and uh, it's the story of a... Of a small stretch of highway in Montana, and <laughs> that area's pivotal role in God's plan for the universe, which um, this might sound weird because there's supposed to be a main character that we established for two entire fucking prequels <laughs> that we watched, um, and he does do lots of stuff in this movie, the main character, but he literally will not matter. No, no. Or will he? He won't. It's all. Fu- no. It's fucking awful. He Nothing. Won't matter will matter in this fucking movie. And Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you thought to yourself, man, I loved the first movie because David R. White snuck Jason Bourne into his trailer, and I loved the second movie because he snuck Jason Bourne and also Mad Max Fury Road into his trailer, (laughs) then you're going to love the third movie because he also snuck a L.L. Bean catalog into his trailer (laughs) because that is how everyone will be dressed. (laughs) Obviously, he was playing word association as they wrote this, and they were like, hey, what do you think everyone's dressed like in the apocalypse? And he was like, uh, L.L. Bean, scarves on their faces. Um, <laughs> the outfits just get more absurd. And of course, of course, there is Kevin Sorbo's performance, oh, which I could do an entire podcast on the 12 lines <laughs> Kevin Sorbo When you says, say podcast, I think you mean not like an episode, like an actual entire oh, yeah, I, weekly podcast. It would be podcast. Eli and the K. I could do Eli and the K. <laughs> 
Um, now, we got into a shitload of trouble for not recognizing Sting in the first one, so I wanted to make sure that we didn't have a similar error this week, so I really did comb through the IMDb page for all the key players in this one. So I want to let everybody know up front that this movie has Michael Bailey Smith in it. Oh, yeah. You'll recognize him as the generic, bald, muscled guy from many of TV's finest shows. <laughs> His IMDb credits include character names such as, I swear I made none of these up, Bouncer, Gunman, Chainman, The Thrill Killer, Brooklyn <laughs> Bridges, Skinhead, Skinhead Prisoner, Skinhead Number 1, <laughs> Monster Man, Henchman, Lead Henchman, that's a promotion, and Skull <laughs> Corbett. Skull Corbett. I like that he kept his last name. Yeah, right. They call Wait, Skull. Well, Corbett's the family Corbett. name, but they call <laughs> Skull. <laughs> Still got to get mail. Also, <laughs> not, yeah, not many people get to play a skinhead and a skinhead prisoner. So that gives you like the dynamic. He's like, I got a lot of range in my yes, skinhead right. performance. <laughs> I can be a regular skinhead or a skinhead, a downtrodden skinhead <laughs> prisoner. Or I could be one of several skinheads. I could be in a group of them. I could be number one out of a group of like five or six, whatever you want. His audition <laughs> monologue is just, Arr. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this movie also, I should point out, has James Denton in it, the famous James Denton, best known as Buzz from Face Off. The third greatest movie of all time. <laughs> and um, also known as the sad guy who eats alone at the Denny's out 101 towards Thousand Oaks. Um, this movie wow. also has Hilti Bowen in it. She played the uh, the female lead, best known as a strong six. Um, <laughs> she also played, uh, this was actually on her fucking IMDb page, like one of the four credits. Clown Girl from the TV miniseries Sex Capades on the episode entitled Get It On with Groupon. Oh, I f did not recognize that. <laughs> right. It's because you can see her face in this movie. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> Jamie, you know what to do. And also, of course, as Eli did allude to this movie, also has Kevin Sorbo in it. And of course, you'll know him as the voice of Crusher in the video game Skylander Giants. Yeah, yeah, of course. So I guess with a cast like that, I don't think we need to do anything else to sell you on this flick. So stick around while we take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll break down all the Jesus-infused Mad Max ripoff that is The Black Rider, Revelation Road. After watching this film, it seems clear that Pure Flix's business model has now become copying notes from a Sunday school lecture into existing action classics. And as hesitant as I am to help these ignorance peddling bigots turn a profit, we're stuck watching this shit one way or the other. So we figure we might as well help ourselves by helping make these movies better. Which is why we've come up with a few of our own ideas for David A.R. White action remakes. When a North Carolina dad finds out his daughter has to pee in a private stall adjacent to the ones transgender women use, he puts all his engineering skills to the test to create an undetectable bionic bigot to help his state enforce their legally mandated discrimination in The Trans Informer Age of Excretions. In the near future, a deadly mixture of accumulated knowledge and critical theological introspection threatens to destroy John's faith once and for all. So in a desperate effort to make Christianity seem sensible enough to cling to, he will venture back in time to stop his college education before it begins in... The Reaffirminator. In a post-rapture hellscape, David A.R. White must protect his family from all the horrible shit that loving God of the Bible does to people who don't like his kid enough. In golden-crowned, iron-breastplate-wearing, man-faced, woman-haired, lion-toothed, scorpion, horse-locust, NATO. Versus Mecha Shark. Oh, versus Batman. Mecha Shark. I had that on DVD. Oh, shit. Yeah. Now I like that, movie. <laughs> that just got so much Let's better. That one. <laughs> I'll watch that shit. And we're back for the breakdown, and we'll start things off with uh, Quentin Tarantino action font Bible quotes. Ah, uh, same note, same note. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote in my notes, ah, I see David R. White managed to sneak Sin City past yeah, the right. this movie. <laughs> I had, I guess, no more masturbating voiceovers. Maybe they were both finished and they're just like, yeah. Or maybe David A.R. White is like, I, I'm tired of trying to write stuff for people to say. So just just pick something out of the Bible and just do a Quentin Tarantino font. It's fine. It's fine. Well, and it, they couldn't have picked a less, like, ominous, awesome quote. I mean, from <laughs> if you want to quote stuff from Revelation, you can find some, like, scary open a movie with shit. But it's the, all about the one horse that has the scales. Like, of right. all the horses, one has a sword and one has the disease. Least impressive and, yeah, it's the yeah. least yeah. impressive weapon. As a matter of oh, fact, it's he's so unimpressive. Some stuff. 
Well, yeah, yeah, right. I mean, it's so unimpressive that later on when we actually see this horse, he's carrying scales or a scythe rather and, instead of scales because it was just too pussy to have him actually riding around. Here. Y'all gained two pounds. Scary. <laughs> I expect that rider to be owners. like, God, what am I going to do with these scales? I'm just, this is just weight, extra weight I'm carrying around. I can't do anything with it. I don't have horse. a free hand here. I've yeah. got one on the range. We already had a guy who scales. kills people with a tool in this series. We can't have someone kill someone with scales. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> it's going to be a little bit tougher. So and then we learn that this movie is taking place two years after the event. <laughs> but I think what happened was everyone involved in the films and, and David Aroyd's family and just anyone who knew him held an intervention was like, we're not letting you do another film until you write literally anything down. Like, make sure you write down <laughs> lines. There's got to be a script. Do you like stage direction? You know, you've seen a script, right? You you kind of, you know what those are? Like, just write at least something. Remember from Evening Shade? You know, you've yeah, seen yeah, yeah. those before. <laughs> and he's like, no, I was just going to do another one where it's like, it's a bunch of, the, oh, the camera slows down, karate, and then 85 minutes later, we got another third movie. We're No, no, no. Write something down, please. This was much more movie like than the first it was. two. Yeah. It was it was almost a movie, mo- a movie like it had movie like characteristics. It mm-hmm. was it, you would you would identify it in the genus of oh this is okay. kind of <laughs> like a movie movie related. Yeah, this is the mirage of water in a desert of movies. Yeah. Like it <laughs> looks from a distance, it's it's a movie, but then you get close and it's just sand and you're going to die. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Couldn't have said it better myself. So we're going to open this movie with Mr. Drake hanging redneck Jean Valjean for stealing a meat pie. <laughs> And not just hanging him, they're going to hand strangle him. Right. They're not yeah. going to like push him off a thing. No, no. Reverse They've just got Vincent D'Onofrio as Kingpin, who's just like, all right, I'm going to lift you up a, a smidgen. Right. Just as, like, don't stand on your tiptoes. You'll ruin this for everybody. <laughs> That's, my exact note here is just put your toes down and you're fine. You're two inches off the ground. You're clearly trying to hold your feet up like that. Just relax them and you're fine. It would be inconvenient, like in 12 Years a Slave and everything. But yeah, you yeah. could handle it. But- but, uh, what happens when he has to hang someone who weighs more than him? How's that going to work? <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I guess I get hanged then. Uh, sorry, whoever weighs more gets gets hanged. That's how this works. Yeah, yeah. add some pulleys. So, that's a mechanical that's advantage. That's why you need the yeah. scales. <laughs> yeah. In this scene, one, one of the villagers comes forward and he's like, do we have to do this? And I call him Christian Christian Slater, the mayor of this movie. <laughs> he explains that it's very necessary to hang people for stealing food. Yes, yeah, exactly. But the town folks aren't so sure about this murdery shit, especially skinny crackhead goth chick. Yeah, this girl will blow you for a gift card to Hot Top. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We have contact information on the show notes. Um, and also, <laughs> this Vincent D'Onofre, the, the bald guy here, I wrote him down in my notes uh, first as The Things Understudy. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I was looking at his IMDb page, holy shit, if he didn't play the fucking thing in a 1994 really? TV show or TV <laughs> movie or whatever that they did. So, yeah, he is actually nice. the poor man's The Thing. My note on this guy was um, Mr. Zvenning. <laughs> my my execution victim. Yeah. <laughs> Which is funny, you guys didn't laugh. It's because Brandy Svenning's dad from Mallrats looks very similar to this character. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry. I giggled. I got it. It was, did my mic cut out where I totally got that joke and that reference? It must have cut out. No, for that. no. And I also didn't splice in some of you laughing earlier um, <laughs> into that spot. Uh, okay, so then we get. So the the, the thing that we got to learn is it's hanging people in the street type apocalypse now, and then bam, Pure Flix Entertainment presents a ripoff of Mad Max. Right. I wrote in my notes. They went full Mad Max. Never go full Mad Max. <laughs> And we sh- we show that it's Mad Max because David R. White, who has grown a beard. Now oh, wait, God. I want to take a moment to talk about David R. White's <laughs> or facial glued hair. some pubes to his face. It's yeah, one or yeah. the other. Yeah, it's ninety nine percent soul patch, <laughs> and then yeah. just the gentlest. If you've ever seen a fourteen year old's pubic hair, that is what. <laughs> Which I have. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. And that is what I'm is imagining on his it now. Face. Actually, let me pull up the pictures. And have, <laughs> <hold> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It t- but he has the thickest, fullest soul patch you could ever ask for. Yeah, so- I thought the same thing. I think he just took some soul patch hair and just like spread it on his cheeks. Like he just took like a comb over <laughs> kind of yeah. a situation. Yeah. Comb yeah. over a beard. Yeah. <laughs> So he's chasing some kidnappers who are in a Mad Max van, and his car from the first two movies is all Mad Maxed out, and they're trying to throw him off by throwing 
concrete blocks oh out God. the back <laughs> of the van at him, <laughs> which is the least effective strategy ever. They just like boop, bounce it's right off. off. <laughs> they don't break anything. They the car they bounce off the car like they might as well be throwing rolled up pieces of paper. Well, and we learn later that they also have real weapons here. Right, they they yes. later will be throwing dynamite and shooting at him, but they wanted to try the concrete blocks first. Don't waste no dynamite on this motherfucker or nothing. Well, and I have to point out the continuity in this scene could not be worse. At one point, they're throwing those like cartoon bombs that are perfect spheres, black spheres with the fuses <laughs> yeah. on the top, pretty much. They say Acme on the side. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they like explode his car, and then the very next shot will be just no damage on his car, nothing no. on his car, completely or on the fine. road behind him when yeah. they're throwing yeah, yeah. dynamite. So they eventually start throwing dynamite out at him yeah. you know like blasters dynamite that takes out <laughs> giant caves and you see a little smoke and then the smoke quote unquote clears because it was all done in oh my god first timers version of after effects and it's just a road yeah. yeah no but then you see also the best is they like they wanted to get the details right i don't know why they couldn't just light the fake dynamite on fire they put in from Microsoft Office clip art, like a, a spark, you know, <laughs> on the dynamite signifying that it's lit. It is so fucking hilarious. I, I love it. I expected the the paper clip to pop I, up I was and be like, say. I see you're making a Christian movie. <laughs> <laughs> do you want a really fake explosion looking thing to just put anywhere? Yeah, sure. Okay, I'll do that. Yes. Throw another handful of bang snaps from the party store. Get them. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> So, and then, of course, while one of the bad guys is trying to light a stick of dynamite, the girl who's kidnapped in the van that he's trying to rescue, apparently, kicks the dude, knocks him out of the van, and so this other bad guy pulls out a knife and stabs her to the hilt in the side. It, with a hunting knife. Yes. Yes. She is not dead from this, as we'll learn later. <laughs> oh, well, it, not yet. <laughs> no, not <laughs> yet. Yes. So, eventually, this car chase ends because after they stab the girl, their van runs into death on a horse. <laughs> right. <laughs> but they they swerve out of the way to miss it and they roll over. Yep. In, instead of just run into the horse, you're in a van. Whatever. <laughs> What's going to happen? But if you're wondering, hey, will death on a horse ever come back during this movie? The answer is Absolutely not. No. We see death on a horse who throws these people out of their van, and then he just fucks off. I don't know where he went. He goes goes to Milwaukee. Who knows? Yeah. You never yeah. see death well, on a horse ever again. He just gradually, gently r strolls down the road a little further, and we yeah. just never catch up. But there. first, he and David R. White like stare at each other, and I wrote in my notes, David R. White's going to fight death. I'm in. <laughs> but instead, right. they just head nod like you ran into your ex. No, at he gives him a little head uh, thumbs up. He's like, "Yeah, yeah cool, got you, got you back, buddy." All right, thanks. See ya. <laughs> See ya. Neck never in this movie. I wanted the black horseman to ask for directions or something like that. It's just, <laughs> just, just Norm McDonald. I'm looking for all the sodomites. <laughs> <laughs> David Arroyo takes a map. See, yeah. See all the red cross hatch area. That's that's the gays. <laughs> oh, all right, all go. gay. Right there. Thank you. No, I'm on I'm I-95. Marked. Am I going north or am I going? <laughs> those people hit me with their cars. So I'm a little. <laughs> You want to go down and to the right. Down and to the right. I don't know right. if you saw my scales. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> but he gets the girl out, brings her into his car, and she's all thirsty and, like, die. And she's like, am I going to die? And I wrote in my notes, you have a knife wound in your body. You sure are going to die. That's how it works. Yeah. Uh -huh. He's got no choice. So he takes out his map. And he, on his map, this is the most ridiculous map oh, I've ever seen. Map. <laughs> on the map, there's a bunch of like red cross hatch area, which Heath mentioned before. And that's where the sodomites that's, that's, are. That's where the gay people are. And then go. there yeah, are like yeah. little bouncy castle stickers. <laughs> and then there is what is very clearly a skull and crossbones. Drawn by a four-year-old. <laughs> yeah. Which he looks at. Point set, and I wrote, ah, he has no choice but to go where the pirates buried their treasure. <laughs> <laughs> Down to the goon docks. Perfect. Yeah, That's where right. we're going. Goonies never say die, <laughs> except for this girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he's off to Skull and Crossbones land. And then we cut to uh, Mr. Drake, the guy that was hanging in Christian Jean Valjean earlier. Uh, w and he's meeting with the bad guys <laughs> at the airplane. <laughs> well, is this, I don't know if this quite qualifies for Christian movie bingo. You guys tell me, you're the ex experts, but 
post rapture instant evil government federation thing. Is that <laughs> is that qualified? Yeah, absolutely. So people, yeah. people are so quick. The minute there's a rapture, everyone's like, "Hey, evil government, evil government." Yeah, 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 yeah evil, evil government. You good? Excellent. Hey, you down for evil government? Okay, who, I'll be evil chairman. Who wants face tattoos. Oh, yeah, all of let's us, definitely all of us. have a face tattoo. We want that. We want that evil go- a chairman. Like, let's give everybody a rent. They're just in- is that? Do people do that in real life? Would they do that? Just yeah, instant evil government. Yeah, and this is the first of many times that a that a set of characters will be dressed entirely in an LL Bean catalog, <laughs> just straight out of the Winter Collection. Apparently, post-apocalyptic means too cold for the desert. <laughs> <laughs> and and he's with this like uh, evil librarian lady who's yes. <laughs> also a uh, bad guy. They, like they honestly, they look like bizarro gay Clark Kent got photoshopped into American Gothic. Like that's <laughs> she looks like the farmer with the pitchfork couple. Uh, so basically, the the end of their conversation is somewhere out in this desert is a guy called the Shepherd, and these <laughs> evil guys really, really want the Shepherd, which is possibly the least intimidating outlaw nickname there is. <laughs> Get something a little more aggressive, like the Goat Herd, or <laughs> the we're Vegan looking Avenger. for buttons. <laughs> <laughs> we're looking for the Tickle Monster. <laughs> So now we cut to the inside of the car where Stabbed Girl has got the classic uh, whisper disease from her <laughs> stab yeah. wound. Oh, yeah, uh-huh. Which is the only time this has ever made sense, because right, I guess she, she might have collapsed. in the lung. Yeah, right, exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, and she's got one of those weird bloodless stab wounds. I mean, I've seen them. I've heard about them in, in medical journals where you just, you get stabbed with a giant knife. No blood happens, but you're definitely still <laughs> But you dying. die six or seven days later. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, if you get enough antibiotics, as yeah. we'll learn <laughs> later yeah, we'll on. Get to that. The no. first thing she says to him in the car is, they say you never lose a fight. And that is... Like, it's like a third grader, like, my name's Billy J. I got held back once and I've never lost a fight. Like, that is, <laughs> it is the most childish, yeah. lame I batted reputation. in Infinity and Little League. Infinity. Yeah. <laughs> right. And we see him lose fights in all three movies Constantly. anyway. He loses yeah. fights constantly he loses like movie. two or three fights in the first 10 minutes of this movie we're not to get to <laughs> basically yeah so uh so yeah basically they're driving along talking about god and and prayers and stuff and then they arrive at the roadblock in the city where they were hanging jean valjean earlier um and they don't they have a like a like a roadblock set up and they don't want to let him in he has to negotiate his way in right but it doesn't work so sophia the goth girl she just mm-hmm. moves. She just moves the car, and they're like, oh, we didn't know someone would move the car. And he just drives into town with this girl, grabs her out of the car, and then Sophia, the goth girl, takes them to the doctor. And uh, by the way, this Sophia character, just real quick on her um, physical appearance, um, she looks like Eddie Redmayne told his plastic surgeon, uh, give me the Megan Fox. <laughs> the Megan Fox, <laughs> And also, so they, they come into town, and he's driving, and she's walking alongside him, and he says to her, like, can't we go any faster? And it's like, that's not fair. She's walking and you're in a car. But she goes, <laughs> we don't want to attract too much attention. Like, are yeah. you invisible when you go slowly? These people How? are T-Rexes. Their eyes are just on <laughs> How is this not attracting attention? This is the most conspicuous thing you could possibly do in Apocalypse Town. Like, you might as well be driving by with hydraulics going, <laughs> bumping, like, rising dirty. This, it looks, at best... Like he's buying drugs at two miles an hour. Yeah, right. But really, it, it looks like he's haggling with a prostitute about the price for a three-way with a 16-year-old corpse that he has in the passenger seat. <laughs> and, of course, we have to end this scene by uh, learning that uh, you don't want to be preaching around here. Folks don't want to hear about that Jesus stuff. Mm. And then we get to Apocalypse Hospital. Now, Apocalypse Hospital is maybe my favorite scene in the movie. It's not the Ooh, best that, scene in the movie. Them's fighting words. <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> but it is one of my favorite scenes in the movie because this is exactly what happens. First, so there are only two people that are in charge of medical care in this town, apparently. <laughs> a black lady and not a doctor, who right. I will refer to <laughs> yeah. from now on as slightly thinner Pete Holmes. Okay. <laughs> and... Not a doctor. Basically, they're like, how's she doing? Is she going to be okay? And he's like, I don't know, man. I'm not a doctor. And everyone ignores that. No one goes like, wait, why are you here then? He's just like, nope, not a doctor. I'm just the guy. The black lady leans down to remove her crucifix, and David R. White immediately assumes she's stealing it. Yeah. She- <laughs> yeah. So that the first line she has is, I'm not stealing it. And he's like, oh, I didn't think you were stealing it. I love you people. What are you talking about? So I voted my- for Obama. 
twice. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but you can't check. And then she, um, th- th- at some point during this scene, they say there's been legends of a guy who saves people. You know, referring to him or something. I was thinking, can there really be legends after two years? Uh, what's, what's the legend? There's got to be a time, they, you know, you, requirement for a legend. You can't be like, oh, yeah, a few months ago, <laughs> there's a legend of a guy. <laughs> there's a legend of a podcaster named Thomas. <laughs> well, they, they definitely lost track of that two years here and there. But I also love that, like, his first line, once they get her in there, the guy's, like, looked at her for two seconds. He goes, how bad is it? And before we learn that he's a doctor, my assumption is that he's going to say, she was stabbed to the hilt in the lung with a Bowie knife. There's not a scale of good or bad here. <laughs> she was stabbed very uh, well. Dead? I, I don't get the yeah, question. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Of course, and uh, we also learn here that, uh-oh, the bad guys are back from that trip to that airstrip or whatever. Uh, but David A.R. White is too busy paying in canned food and sterno to notice that troubles are coming. Right. So he's paying in canned food and sterno, and they're like, we've only got enough antibiotics for her for the first, for a few days. And I wrote in my notes, <laughs> antibiotics are don't die pills, right? Just, yeah, <laughs> right. We wouldn't want that punctured lung to get yeah. infected. Yeah, no, I had the same note. Like, do you, do you stuff the antibiotics in the wound? At no, no point do they address the wound. Do they show the wound? They don't, no. for all I know, they don't know what it is. Like, no, they're just like, no, nah, she's been stabbed, but there's well, nothing. It's very clear. He is not a doctor. He just likes yeah. touching girls. <laughs> so like you said, there's not a doctor. And then the black lady's job is just to nag, I think. So you've got, that's their staff is just yeah. a nag person and, 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 you know, guy, the not a doctor. The antibiotics guy. The guy yeah. who puts the pills in a pile near the. The, the wound like a band-aid pile so she doesn't yeah cool. right right no it's like it's like the tussin of their day yeah exactly <laughs> um so then of course like the uh the the gate guards run up and they're like sophia being starting shit let some dude in here with a with an injured girl uh when when mr drake and poor man's michael chiklis show up so now they go and like surround his car so that he can be all actiony and uh revelation road bingo don't do this. You don't want to do yeah. this. Don't do this. Don't do this. <laughs> yeah, I, I've got, if you don't give us your keys, we're going to slowly come at you one at a time and make sure to yell to announce that we're coming at you. When we do. My turn! I, I, cause, yeah, because the, the guy even yells, kill him, and I wrote in my notes, kill him, one at a time. Yeah, and then at some point, the bald guy gets a gun. He's like, oh, I'm going to put a stop to this. David A.R. White throws a hammer Full speed, like 90 mile per hour fastball hammer hits his face. Then somehow David A.R. White covers 30 feet of ground instantly. The next scene is just him. It's like that scene from Monty Python where they're running, you know, at the castle forever. Yeah, and then the yeah, next right, cut right. Is, it was like that. And he kicks him again. And the bald guy's like, oh, <laughs> like he's got he's gotten hammered in the face at full speed, kicked and then he's just like, come on, man, don't do that. You know, like, oh, they don't, no. they're not very good. <laughs> they're not good at representing the actual damage that might happen for some of these things. Also, can, can we talk about what um, the people in this scene are wearing? Um, <laughs> they're, first of all, they're wearing roller hockey safety equipment. Again, <laughs> I don't know why, like full shin guards. And even, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and the posse is insane. The the bad guy cop posse. There's first of all, correct me if I'm wrong. Was there a little person in leather pants, a cowboy hat, and an infinity scarf? And was an that infinity happening? scarf. I'm pretty sure Literally that was happening. An infinity scarf. Okay, I I had that correct. And uh, there's also a J Crew peacoat model with a nightstick. He looked pretty intimidating. Um, it, it looks like a country music boy band posse. Basically, yeah. yeah. Might as well be the village people. They just <laughs> extra characters. Yeah, may very well have been. And I also love too that like just when David A.R. White out bad asses like nine people and pulls guns out of their hands and throws shit from across the room to knock them unconscious all of a sudden like mr drake the main bad guy shows up and he fires a gun up in the air so now he has to stop right and i wrote in my notes oh so that gun's a problem <laughs> yeah right the other ones <laughs> yeah. not so much but uh. now but now he's captured um also and sophia has to stay in the naughty shed until she's taken yeah, care of she gets apparently. put into a garage filled with things that would help her escape like yeah, here look. have a hacksaw <laughs> and an escape hatch and a yeah. button that you can push that opens all doors everywhere there's like the gun from portal they're like yeah, just use it. <laughs> so then we cut to uh the to the garage where they're holding david a.r white chained like jesus to a oh, forklift <laughs> i wanted to see the part right before this just like you guys mind chaining me up like 
like Jesus with, yes, with my yeah, arm than, instead of just regular. You got me chained up regular. It's a thing I do. It's a thing sure, I do. No just problem. Yeah, absolutely. It. Perfect. Also, the chains are just wrapped around the end of the forklift. You could just right, walk right. Yeah, forward exactly. and you you'd be fine. You just have a lot of chains on you. Exactly. Yeah. He's handcuffed to the forklift, but there's just a, a whole bunch of enormous black chain like near that right. for no reason. Yeah, right. 90% of around. the chains are completely superfluous. There's, they're not doing anything. They're just like, hey, we want to make this look really good when we tie a All guy up. The chains throughout this film you can't have a character do any real struggling because they would just slide off of the impossible <laughs> yeah, right. way they are tied <laughs> yeah right exactly and okay so then we get um we get sophia and she snuck out of the gaping hole in the punishment shed um and i guess they've never had to deal with imprisoning people before in this town that hangs people over meat pies but um <laughs> but then we get her sneaking out to like save david ar white i guess and She's sneaking across a tin fucking roof. Oh, There's God. a bad guy walking back and forth on this tin roof. I don't know why you... I guess they they <laughs> patrol all the roofs in this town or whatever. But he's like 10 feet away from her, but he's facing the other way. So it's... Yeah, he's a guard from Metal Gear Solid. Exactly. That means yeah, he can't hear anything he can only, he's not looking at. Right. right. He, yeah, he has like a flashlight vision that you can see is like a cone in front of him. And as long as you stay out of if that... If he had heard her, a little uh, exclamation point, <laughs> would have appeared above his head. Yeah. Well, and they didn't even damp out her sound either. She goes across no. the clang, 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 clang. <laughs> Right behind him. The only time they ever get the sounds right in this movie is right. in yeah. this scene. But, but yeah. she does hide by going to the edge of the roof behind the nothing. And yeah. Can't yeah. Tell exactly. She's on the roof with him. And now we get a chat between the mayor uh, and David R. White. And in this, we learn that he used to be a gas station attendant oh part my God. time. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I want to say too that we that we, when we open this scene to this conversation, the first thing we see is Mr. Drake tearing pages out of David A. R. White's Bible just to really ruffle the feathers of the audience. Oh, right. Yeah. And you, and then the mayor guy said, like, he has David A. R. White's driver's license. Like, <laughs> why does he still have his license? Because he gets pulled over in the post. This is expired, motherfucker. Yeah. He's like. <laughs> you better get a new photo this one's terrible and then this guy the mayor his acting method is look anywhere else in the room but at david a.r white i think his condition for being in the movie was like i'm not gonna look at that guy i can't look at that guy's fucking face well, especially like, not with the beard when he's telling his gas station sob story which by the way is the stupidest backstory i've ever heard of this guy was not a fucking gas station part that doesn't even exist he was definitely in cialis commercials though he was definitely in that <laughs> for sure that was it. He should have said that. I used to just do boner pill. I don't need Cialis with that guy. The first thing he <laughs> says to David R. White is, do you know who I was before this? And I wrote in my notes, Kevin Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> and then we learn that they're both looking for the same thing. Grace. That was the name. That's the name of the doctor that could save the girl with the stab wound. Get it? They're looking yeah, and for And he's like, I don't know why Grace. my wife ran off with the shepherd, but <laughs> you find the shepherd and you'll find Grace. Yeah. You get it? Yeah. You, yeah. It's Jesus. <laughs> Grace is, I meant that in the, the term yeah, at Grace. At that point, he the addressed the camera directly and <laughs> yeah, was like, guys, right. you get it? It's Grace. <laughs> Stanza over. Wink. Yeah, so apparently, yeah. I guess the, 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 what we're supposed to be learning here is that the shepherd is this bad guy that the, the, the bad, or the good guy that the bad guys want to get, but only a man of faith can find him. So now they have a man of faith to use to, uh, well, you know, whatever, to, to fucking ferret him out. Right. So they, they decide to let him go and on the condition that he'll go and find the shepherd and this surgeon lady named Grace. And as they send him off, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio is very unhappy about that. Yeah. He's, he doesn't want to let him go. And the mayor turns to him and says, when the perfect guy comes along for the right job, that's something you can't ignore. And I wrote the Eli Bosnick story. <laughs> sure you did. Um, yeah, he says, you, you, you sure you're doing the right thing? You're not finding religion on me, are you? And then they just right. let the scene die on that Well, question. the mayor goes, no, you're finding religion. Go! <laughs> <laughs> did religion say anything about me, though? Like, like did you talk to religion? <laughs> and then uh, we get ominous driving cuts. And, of course, because there's a thing visible in the scene, David A.R. White has to pull over and take a look. 
Yeah, because he checks out everything, <laughs> everything that's ever by the side of the road, ever, in all three movies. Yes. Uh, he never passes by anything. Yeah, I got a couple notes before this. First off, yes, actual tumbleweeds. They found oh, yeah. tumbleweeds and were like, this is perfect. <laughs> Let's send, and you can tell that like, it was just a guy off to the side that like drop kicked the tumbleweed. Like, here, I'll get it to go across the, and then also sky shot. Still contrails in the air all across the sky, <laughs> despite the fact that we're in the post apocalyptic world. Plenty of commercial airline flying going on. Just well, letting yeah, you guys know. You know, I mean, we saw the 666 tattoo guy standing near an airplane. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. obviously, no, but it's, it's probably just him <laughs> just driving. US Air is still flying running. back yeah. and forth and yeah. back and forth. So, apparently, so he pulls over for a suspicious golf cart. Right. <laughs> on the side of the road where apparently some cannibals had murdered the go- who's driving around the apocalypse in a fucking golf cart <laughs> uh oh the cannibals <laughs> right. what stick I your feet out the bottom dog to you <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, you deserve tired, to get cannibalized if you're driving that thing in the in the apocalypse. Yeah, yeah. this but is if, exactly what Jim Baker was talking about. <laughs> That's how we exactly. should have listened. Should have had some buckets. God damn it! Um, but apparently they didn't take the golf cart's gas, so he's going to siphon off the gas just in case we didn't get the whole we're doing the Mad Max thing. Um, and when he goes to get his gas tank, he, he finds out that Sophia has been hiding in his trunk the whole time. Remember the girl that was going to save him, but then didn't, and it didn't matter. Anyway, she's in the trunk. So now he has another perky, kind of hottish, if you look at her in the right light, sidekick. And so now we cut back to the village. And Mr. Clean is is taking all of the village's medical supplies away. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, because because the girl is an outsider. Well, it's and it's not like they were doing anything anyway. He just was piling them next to the girl. Like you can't have these next to sick people anymore. I'm sorry. (laughs) Well, and I'm sorry. And this is supposed to be the oh, they're so evil. They're not going to give that 16 year old girl all the antibiotics. But I'm thinking to myself, okay, you got a whole town full of people. You got a 16 year old girl that just showed up, already stabbed, and is definitely going to fucking die. Why would you? Throw away antibiotics on her. This makes sense. This is death panels, yes, but it's good death panels. <laughs> good death panels is the name of my band, by the way. We're playing this Friday. Uh, the, check us out on more SoundCloud. More like the mediocre uh, death panels anyway. But, uh, Hillary in 2016, is... good death panels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the bad guys are heading off now to, to go get him because he's got Sophia. And apparently she's going to fuck everything up because she's not a Christian and only a Christian can find the shepherd. That's right. really what they're worried about. And damn it if they didn't rent some Humvees. So the bad guys are gonna, are gonna, uh, go after them. You definitely want the least fuel efficient vehicles you can have. <laughs> like the, I said oh, last yeah. movie. When there's no gas available, drive a tank. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so we cut back to the side of the road and David R. White lets her out of the trunk, but says he's not taking Sophia with him. So he just, Leaves her with the golf court and drives off. Right, in cannibal country. <laughs> right, in cannibal country. But rather, th- so she's like stuck there. But then there's another thing by the side of the road. And <laughs> as we know, this is an ADD <laughs> trip across country. <laughs> so he gets out because he can hear the screams, oh I my guess. God. Yeah. yeah. And we he encounters the people from the hills have eyes trying to eat a lady's baby. <laughs> <laughs> can, <laughs> we need to talk for an hour about this quote unquote <laughs> trap yes. that happens here. It is the most illogical trap of all time. <laughs> it makes no fucking sense. So first off, they're relying on someone to just pull over all the time, which I guess people do. When when the world is full of people who are going to murder you, you definitely want to just pull over and wander off the road, leave your car, do yeah. all that. Oh yeah. And and then they're relying on them hearing the the yelling. Like like they're just he, someone driving by is just going to hear yelling. Well, outside. the first fifty people they ate were on star operatives. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and then the trap is so the the woman has like a, a you know a spear with a knife you know ta- duct tape to it. She's tr- she's attacking the guys, and then our hero David R. A. R. White. He just walks just walks in a straight line toward them, and then a rope just catches his leg. Just somehow he walks exactly where a rope is. And then the guy says, works every time, he says. <laughs> works yeah. every time. Every time they lure people down there, impossibly stage a weird fucking drama scene where they're like fighting. Oh, no, let's get her baby. And then a guy just doesn't shoot him, by the way. There's lots of guns in this world. No, he doesn't <laughs> shoot him. Every time a guy walks straight onto that rope. It's fucking illogical. It is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. 
And when you see like two farmers trying to steal a baby from a meth addict who has a knife, st- that's not suspicious to you as the special ops commando well, as you're walking up to that? And I'm sorry, <laughs> you didn't but see that might be a trap. Like how many people, like realistically, how many people hear a woman screaming in the in the distance and go, "Now oh, let's go towards that." Oh, I'm outnumbered and they're and they're armed. Let me walk closer. And and so yeah. I can set off their wily e. coyote trap. If I hear a woman screaming in the distance, I just think that I left my computer on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, oh fuck! I thought I closed that window. <laughs> yeah. So they've knocked him unconscious. Um, that's he he lost a fight, guys. Just in case you're keeping track. Well, he knocks him unconscious with a full full power baseball bat swing at his head, and so that yeah. you know that puts you out for a couple minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> Boy, you wake up <laughs> yeah. fine later, Ow. but. You have a little yeah. bump, like a bald bump on the top of your head that sticks up. <laughs> right, That's right. Some tweeting birds, perhaps. Which means that it's now time for us to cut back to the not doctor and black lady. <laughs> and the first line of this scene is, she's got a fever. And I wrote in my notes, she's got a fever and the only solution is more cowbell. <laughs> and the only yeah. prescription. Antibiotics or more cowbell? One or the other. <laughs> Um, and she, she keeps turning to him and going, what do we do? And I keep wanting this character to go, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. Oh, I just saw a girl who that. couldn't resist. I feel bad <laughs> about getting involved. In How this do you think I'm still a doctor when my technique is to just pile closed medicine next to a person that's all i know how to do i don't know what they do after that i have no but idea luckily the black lady has a plan yeah she's gonna she... give her her crucifix necklace back <laughs> yeah. because god doesn't know that people would rather not die of their stab wounds unless they're marked as his children apparently but that's okay because now we cut to the cannibal compound all right now it's important <laughs> to note that we've seen a couple of times now that sophia has been following him in her golf cart <laughs> the whole time so yeah <laughs> exactly. So she's caught up where they have David A.R. White chained down in the Dexter room. Yeah. yeah, she lost her drive in the rough, so she... <laughs> oh, <he's... laughs> and this is where we're supposed to get this scary character who's like the cannibal guy who cuts people up, but mm-hmm. it's just James Blunt. It's just James <laughs> Blunt with 70s bush on his face. Yeah, trying and his a... damnedest to grow a beard. Every time David A.R. White is tied up, it's chain-based for some reason. I don't know. what. Wh- when did they decide in this movie, like, guys, if you're going to tie someone up, chains. That's what you – chains are terrible for tying someone up. It's awkward. It doesn't what, – what every time – it takes a lot of work. They're just, just duct tape. It's fine. Yeah. Rope. Anything. Yeah. Saran wrap works for Dexter. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's what I do. I, 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 cut that. <laughs> yeah, cut that. Cut that. <laughs> Your level of knowledge is disturbing. I know. I know. Let me tell you where you can go. Okay, there's an Amazon. I actually have a product on Amazon. And actually, you can, you know how on Amazon, there's a, you can set a subscription. So I've timed out kind of how much rope I need, for, you know, when, and then Amazon just sends it. To, I've said too much. This is his fourth podcast. <laughs> And uh, so just as the um, psychotic guy is about to kill him and, and chop him up for, for ribs or whatever, mama yells yes. uh, off yeah. distance. Yeah. And, and apparently Howard's mom from the Big Bang Theory lives yeah. in this <laughs> yes. animal compound. I love this character so much. We never see her. We just hear her yelling from off screen. I want her movie so fucking bad. I wrote in my notes, she finally ate Gilbert Grape. <laughs> <laughs> And then we meet Kevin Sorbo. Kevin Sorbo. And it is this glorious. Is the greatest <laughs> moment in my entire life. It is like, it's like Adam Reeks had Richard Dawkins stroke. Is what, <laughs> that's the accent he's doing. It's half Australian, half Scottish, and he's dressed like if Peter Pan lived in Alaska. Right. <laughs> it's fucking ridiculous. I think it's actually a socialist accent. This oh, time. Totally. socialist oh. accent. It's a democratic socialist. And yeah, he he's also wearing um roller hockey safety equipment. Kevin Sorbo is too. <laughs> but to his credit, it's part of an ensemble. <laughs> part of an ensemble. And uh he kind of looks like the first Openly gay themed WWE character. Yeah, they they had, call me the converter. <laughs> <laughs> Macho man dandy savage. I had, uh, Australian Liberace, but, uh, I'm, I'm writing in my notes. Like, I, I had to stop this movie so many times. Oh, God. Uh, laughing at this goddamn accent. Um, I'm like, Kevin Costner so would be giggling at this the, shit. The henchman had to stop the movie because right, of the accent. Right. He's like, seriously, what the fuck is the accent? I, I mean, what are you do even we, we don't need to cut. For? I would ask you this. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> And all during this, 
the girl is trying to rescue uh, David A.R. White by trying keys in the various locks that are on the chains. And she tests the keys by jamming it on the keyhole and turning it, like twisting yes. twisting the key <laughs> on the key. It's like, that's not how keys work. It either goes in or it doesn't. You don't need to, like, jam it and then twist it on top of the keyhole. That doesn't fucking do anything. And right. This is all happening while Brian Boitano with George Harrison's beard is outside negotiating the price for the car. That's going to be very important. Kevin Sorbo is buying his super badass car. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and then, so she's trying to rescue him quick before he comes back from buying the car. But, oh, no, he comes back and now she's caught and she's screaming and he's going to table saw her face off is that that's the most efficient a man who was just holding a hunting knife yeah right two (laughs) seconds ago is like i think i'm gonna go with table saw we're in his murder (laughs) shed we're in his evil murder what shed. About the best he what about a lathe? What about a lathe? What if I smooth her face a little bit a like jigsaw. an ellipse? Will you mind lying across this thing and I'm just going to slowly push you forward into this? <laughs> yeah. So, and then of course, at the same time, uh, our, our hero is still chained up in the back, but he manages to knock his table over and kick some water onto the power oh, strip God. and short out the table saw. So- <laughs> this room is just a series of things conveniently set by his feet that he can kick over to help her somehow. Like first it's water and then he sees a bucket of like acme slippery fluid well, and right then he the kicks f- that. Yeah, the terminal <laughs> viscosity scene here. I'm yeah. convinced that this cannibal is actually grown up post apocalyptic Kevin McAllister. Like, he's just like- <laughs> Well, right. Okay, so I've got to explain this to the audience. So what happens is he, the two of them, the 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 girl and the bad guy are wrestling. David A.R. White still chained up. So he kicks over a bucket of grease, and the grease slides down onto the floor in such a way as to cause them both to slip. But only the bad yeah. guy breaks his face against the table as he falls. He has done this math in his head. Yeah. And they react like, yep, that's about how exactly that, that was, was going to go. That's <laughs> good move. <laughs> yes. Ah, I was thinking you would do exactly that and that all would happen. Definitely. Ah, uh, the cartoon head bunk. Good strategy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Apparently they couldn't afford a banana peel for the scene. Might as well. It would have made more bit. sense. Yeah, well, right, because then she wouldn't. Anyway. So, yeah, then we get the two of them making their lackadaisical escape. And she's very upset because he didn't kill them. When he had the chance, he, he tied him up and left him there. Right. He's too Christian. He's got a, he's basically the rock from the rundown, except nobody cares. He's like, I don't use <laughs> guns except for the several times later in this movie where I'll <laughs> use guns and then earlier and then. Yeah, exactly. Who, who knows? <laughs> I live by a coat. Well, it's, there's some, some rules. Okay. I, yeah, never mind, actually. Yeah. <laughs> More of a philosophy structure. <laughs> And yeah, well, we don't want to lose the entire Second Amendment crowd is what we're saying. Yeah. And, uh, and this is where we learn, by the way, that Kevin Sorbo's character's name, because they say, oh, well, the car was sold to a man named Honcho. Honcho, yes. Honcho. <laughs> and so we cut oh, to God. Honcho's post-apocalyptic flea market <laughs> we're gonna yeah, spend a this. lot of time here too. <laughs> everyone at this flea market hustles and bustles all day they're just like not only are they trading things they're furiously trading yes. things. oh yo sunglasses yo, yo, get, get, get. like how do they have all this energy to just be vigorously tra- it's all those scenes on the stock exchange that you see when like panic and everyone's tra- it's all that times 10 yeah right. And they could not be selling a weirder variety of things. The flea market seems to include (laughs) cars, children Mm -hmm. in cages, and the sunglasses (laughs) off a guy's face. (laughs) We don't see, like, food or any of that. There's just a scene later on when our guy takes his sunglasses off and is like, huh? And then yeah, hands it those. to someone like that. And the, they're furiously trading these these objects yes, all day, are. just back and forth. Like I trade you that. You want it back here? Here, take it back for this. Take <laughs> handkerchief here. Take a handkerchief. I'll trade that. Give me glasses. It's just ridiculous. Yeah. So Sorbo pulls up at the flea market in in his new car in an outfit that begs for fish in his shoes. Um. And and he pulls out. A civil war, a revolutionary <laughs> war. What the oh, fuck God. was this gun? Handheld pirate cannon. It's actually yeah, right, a handheld right. pirate cannon in his oh, hand. Oh man, like, I had these <laughs> same notes. I want, I was like, why does he have a fucking flintlock kind of gun? And then my note is here. I literally Googled 
old timey pirate gun to see what it was. <laughs> like that was all I could think of to Google. First result was exactly that gun. I swear awesome. to God. Was Kevin Sorbo. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Where did he get that? Like, how would you even have that? Who the fuck knows? But he wants to let, he wants to wave it around and tell everybody that if they fuck with his car, he's going to skin them alive and feed them to the pigs, which is an odd threat to make when you're pointing a gun at someone. Right. Which his accent is so indecipherable that I wrote in my notes, I will skin you alive and feed you to my paints. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He's got like Bob Ross in the other room. Also, I love to where oh, the whole time we're getting the um, bad guys following along the scene like Prince Humperdinck and um, Princess Bride, like, you know, that will cut to them with the rednecks going, hmm, there was a big fight here. Oh, the, it looks like the victory uh, went was off this a mighty way. duel. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> it ranged all over. <laughs> Anybody want some fuel? And <laughs> so it rhymed with duel. Sorry. Oh, I got gotcha, you. Gotcha. <laughs> oh, I. Yeah. All right. All right. That was like that was meta. So we cut to David A.R. White and uh, Sophia doing the walk along the road to talk about Jesus scene. Oh, my <laughs> but God. It's, it's super duper boring and slow. Like the first three minutes of them on screen, she's just like, so you want to smell my finger? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been awesome. Are you kidding? I would have loved that. <laughs> the best part of the movie. Um, yeah, but eventually we learn that she wants him to teach her to be a Christian. Yeah, can you? I wrote in my notes. Can you teach me to Christian? Do I have to poop backwards? <laughs> right. <laughs> There's absolutely nothing to learn. Yeah, nothing. He, she always says, "Is teach me to believe what you believe." Like, why well, don't? How do I do that? What you do you did mean? It. Just, be, just, yeah. <laughs> just say like, "Oh, Jesus is our savior." And that's, that's basically all I do. That's pretty much the whole. <laughs> you want to know what I do? I just say like, "Yeah, we're saved, uh, Jesus, etc." That's about it. Yeah, but as they're walking down, suddenly he looks out and she goes like, what is it? And he says, it's suspenseful music. Get down. Yeah. And it, it turns out that there's a crazy man wandering around in the woods yelling for the shepherd that they're looking at. And we're like, oh, a schizophrenic. He should be able to help. Right. And my music note for this scene is, hurry, cartoon mouse. I don't want you to get caught by the cat. <laughs> So, yeah, so he starts talking to this schizophrenic guy who apparently met the shepherd and, and he wants this guy's help. So he offers to trade him. He basically says, like, OK, I'll give you this Gideon Bible with pages ripped out of it and notes written on it. If you help me find the voices in your head, that's basically <laughs> where our character's going at this point. And the guy's like, and the, by the way, the lady is like, he's fucking crazy. And I wrote in my notes, he is crazy, <laughs> sexy Mila Kunis. <laughs> <laughs> I think unsexy me like Jonas in my opinion, but yeah, you know, to each his own. I like a strong jaw. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> so he, he looks, he, he pulls out his map. And he's like, point to me on the map where uh, you saw the guy. And the guy immediately points, oh, there. I'm like, no, that's not how maps work, but okay. <laughs> yeah, luckily I got a really good aerial view before I left. Yeah, so right. right. <laughs> I was going to say, he's off his rocker, but he's good, great with maps. He's like, oh, yeah, I remember we were right there about longitude. Uh, the, you know. <laughs> right. Um, anyway, so he gives him the Bible like he said he would for helping him find the shepherd. And as soon as he gets it, he gets shot by the rednecks and says, Jesus forgives me so that we know he gets to go to heaven. But he, he, yeah, but he dies while reading the front cover of yeah. the Bible. Does that count? I think like, so. Last word, just like, placed by the Gideons. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think hey, the, guy, the old guy from the second and the first movie did it. Well, right. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's yeah, an exactly. excellent part of the Bible. We've already learned. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so they start to run off. But, of course, he's got to go back for the Bible like it was Indiana Jones's hat. Right. So they're running from the Hills Have Eyes people. And their way of hiding is they get behind thinner and thinner and less and less concealing <laughs> trees as they right. go. Eventually, they're just standing in front of grass like they won't be able to shoot us through this. <laughs> well, and it's, it's, it's because they're chasing him through about – uh I don't know, 10 yards of trees in somebody's backyard. <laughs> right. Thomas mentioned this last time. They have a lot of trouble with distances. This is one of those times. Like, And they might as well pass the same road sign eight times in this little 10-yard forest. It was ridiculous. Well, and I love this fucking, this exchange that they have, too, as they're running. Because she says, why didn't you just kill him when you had the chance? And he says, never kill a man when there's another way. And she says, is that what it says in your book? And he doesn't say... No, it says to smash your enemy's babies head first into the rocks and then genocide their cows. I had to make up my own fucking rules. You can't find yeah. morals in this thing. But that's what he should have said. 
she's constantly asking him like, oh, is, is that what's in the, the Bible? Is that like everything he does? Like, oh, I just, uh, we're going to stop at this tree. Is that what it said in the, in the Bible? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what it said in the Bible. That's what it said in the fucking Bible. <laughs> to hide behind this tree. It's like, just read it. At a certain point, you could just read the Bible. It's not that hard. You don't have to ask somebody what it says. Of course, you would have no fucking clue what Christianity was at that point, but they're not going to admit that in this movie. So yeah. So he tells her to run hide in the house from Blair Witch Project while he takes care of business, I guess. Right. And his version of taking care of business is to turn into Wiley e. Coyote to try and kill these people. He hangs his jacket on a tree. Right. They all see, and this is not like a, it's not like um, oh, I see the corner of the jacket no. behind the tree and I'm going to shoot it. It's very clearly just the jacket hanging on some branches. <laughs> Nobody could confuse it for a person. Nobody. Dick Cheney would have looked at this and been like, that's not a guy. That's just a, that's just a jacket. I'm not going to shoot that in the face. <laughs> and it's levitating like 10 feet off the ground. Whatever. Yeah, right, right. Shoot it anyway. It's a ghost jacket. Shoot it. Um, they shoot like four rounds into it too. They're like, oh, let me, let me reload. Right, okay, I'm still right. going to shoot this jacket. Yeah, they shoot the jacket like it's Baltimore cops shooting a black guy. <laughs> oh, God. And then we cut over to her in the creepy house, and she's found dead people food with rapture ashes and really freaks out about that. But then when she finds creepy old ghost lady staring out the window, she seems oh. fairly nonplussed. This makes less sense than – no, I can't say that. This is on the top 30 <laughs> list of things that make no oh, fucking yeah. sense in this movie. <laughs> There's just a lady who appears, starts talking to her, and my thought was like, oh, did she not get raptured? Are we going to find right. out she's evil? Does she, ha does she have some weird past? And then she just resets. Yeah. Like, disappears. <laughs> reset button and she's back in the chair their goal was like let's just think of something creepy but it doesn't there's no explanation for right. it is that in the rules this scene is that in the bible this scene is just like a scene from a scary movie but jesus is the monster <laughs> basically yeah exactly yeah. it's just groundhog day and every day i wake up and i'm watching this fucking movie great <laughs> That's hell. And they yeah. absolutely never explained this. So, yeah. No. And meanwhile, David A.R. White's got wood. And by that, I mean two giant pieces of wood that he's going to whack these people to death with. Now, keep in mind, he's going to kill most of these people anyway, but he's like turning down her gun. No, I'd rather beat him to death with a, <laughs> with a large log. <laughs> also, he manages to duck one bullet or whatever and make the one guy shoot the other guy. Oh, that this is so absurd. Yeah. <laughs> He's standing there in front of the guy, and the guy shoots the gun, and he just like, boop, just dodges. Not <laughs> Matrix style, just like, boop. And he shoots the other guy, and he's like, oh, he got us with the old dodge the bullet trick. <laughs> <laughs> right, what? <laughs> and then, of course, for the final ba uh, uh, hillbilly, David A.R. White just shakes his head really badassly, and, and the guy runs away. Yeah, for the first time and last time in this series, the... Don't do it. Works. Yeah, right. One guy yeah. in this series goes, all right, fine. <laughs> well, somewhere in this scene, too, a guy drew a knife, and every time someone draw, there's a lot of fucking knives in this movie. Every time someone draws one, it sounds like a samurai sword coming out of it. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> It's like, it's just a knife. Just take it out. It's just So this is knife. James Blunt. After he disarms James Blunt, James Blunt pulls out a knife. Mm -hmm. Then James Blunt, I wanted... James Blunt to just pull out a series of more and more ridiculous <laughs> weapons to attack David. Irwin. Like he's got a rubber chicken and then he's got a, a glass half full of milk. And they would all make the same sound. It would go ka like every time. Yeah, right, right, exactly. Um, or sometimes it would go ch yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so he runs, the last guy runs off and, and, and Sophia has to shoot him to death or whatever. The, right, I wrote in my notes, Sophia shot first. Well, she did. You, <laughs> <laughs> she totally Han Soloed that shit. Well, his, his his gun was empty, though. So he knew that, went in, and pulled an empty gun on somebody <laughs> oh, with a right, full gun. Yeah. So you know, totally your fault. Really thinking this through. Um, so meanwhile, back at the Apocalypse Flea Market, Mr. Clean has shown up, and he steps out of his Humvee. He, like, basically, this is the series of events. He pulls in, steps out of his Humvee, and calls his boss. No sign of the rider or Sophia. You've been there for two seconds, you lazy yeah. fuck. He's he's in the center of the fucking bazaar in Turkey, and he looks around for a <laughs> second and goes, they're not here. Yeah, right. <laughs> no wonder you yeah. couldn't fucking find the shepherd. You would just show up somewhere and be like, nope. nope. <laughs> <laughs> they're not in my immediate vision right in front of me, so therefore not here. Yeah. So yeah. this is... This is, this is, I think my, it's so hard to, it's not my favorite scene. It's one of my favorite <laughs> scenes in the movie. The mayor and Kevin Sorbo, Honcho, have yeah. this like, you better help us find 
Sophia back and forth, and he's basically like, yeah, mate, if you want me to help you, you go to help me out. And he grabs a girl in a North Face hat who could not be more of a strong four. Like, she obviously was just an extra who was like, oh, I'm in the movie. And he's he's like, all oh, the ladies? So she's supposed to be a prostitute? But yeah, she could she's... not look less prostitute She seemed as surprised by that turn as anyone else, yeah. Uh, yeah, and he tells them ultimately because they, they find the car and and, and and he's got the car. So and then he, he eventually tells them that I bought this car from the weird rednecks out at the farm. <laughs> and I also love that they that that's the use that it's out at the farm. Like I, I just love in the writers' room somebody where somebody's like, I need a name for the for the farm, and somebody else was like, Fuck off. Okay, never mind. I don't, I don't <laughs> need it that bad. Just a farm, I guess. Okay, but you're handling all the lightning for movie one. Go. Fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Why do we keep Mean- hiring him? <laughs> Meanwhile, people are still furiously trading sunglasses back in the forth. background. In the yeah. background, hey, hey, sunglasses, sunglasses, sunglasses. So now, now they've decided that okay. So Mr. Drake through this weird fucking series of logical steps that Jeff Goldberg would look at. Or Gold, what's what's his name? Goldblum. <laughs> Goldblum. That's it. This weird series of it's fucking logical. Good, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So Jeff Goldblum, Rube, Rube Goldberg thought here. <laughs> And he's like, oh, well, I guess the guy is gonna, is gonna have a, uh, he's gonna d- defeat the guys at the farm and then he's gonna come back looking for his car, which he'll know is at this bazaar somehow. So we'll just wait there. Luckily, Mr. Beltface is here to watch until he shows up. This and guy. Mr. Beltface. <laughs> go on, go on. He's just Please. got a fucking ace bandage wrapped around his face like nine times because he's three other characters in this movie. Oh, you're talking, <laughs> so you're talking about the, uh, the Hamburglar. Yeah. Talking about that's the Hamburglar. The guy. Yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> Fucking amazing. So then we cut to them chatting by the fire, and the first line she has in this movie is, it was quick. Too quick. And I wrote the Eli Bosnick story. Well, every yeah. one of us probably expected, or was hoping for David Airway to go, yeah, sorry. Um, sorry first about time that. I get so really pretty. excited. And, uh, it's this apocalypse, man. It's, it's this apocalypse. I just, I get, oh, so it gets me off my game. Sorry. But no, she was talking about killing the bad guy, not fucking David A. R. White. Um, and so, she uh, she mentions turn the other cheek there. Yeah. And he's like butt sex. Wait, what? <laughs> so, no, what? what? Nothing. No, no. You go. You go. Finish your yeah. thought. Finish well, your it's, thought. It's, yeah, it's was, along the theme of she has no idea what's in the Bible. She's like turn the other cheek. He said that. I I think it was Jesus or was that Woody Allen? Is it Jesus? <laughs> Woody Allen? She says it like that. Like did he say that? I wrote in my notes. Yeah, but he also told that story about cutting people's heads off if they don't serve you well. So like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So the way we the way we get here is she wants to know if she can still go to heaven since she killed this guy and he's like, yeah, no, you murder all the people you want. You oh, just have to kiss yeah, Jesus' ass. Are you it's, sorry? Yeah, that's, yeah, as that's, long as you're sorry, don't fucking worry the about it. the only thing that works out. And then they turn the other cheek. Okay, so this is what happens. She goes, like, turn the other cheek. Isn't that what he said? And, 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 you know, David Arroyd's like, yeah. And he's just like, she's just like, well, what if somebody's trying to kill you? He's like, I'm still working on that. I'm like, yeah, it's a shame nobody tried to kill Jesus or you'd have a ready example of what to do. <laughs> the WWJD would be all filled in for you, you fucking dumbass. <laughs> and of course, it's also problem of evil time. Problem of uh. evil time. And this is a very original answer. Yeah, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. It depends entirely on this movie existing. Right, yes. It doesn't count now. That's what, that's what happens. Basically, it it's the now. God should at least get a participation trophy defense. Yeah. What we learn is that God was stopping all the evil. So, like, God was okay with a certain amount of baby rape, but now that, like, the apocalypse has happened, look how much baby rape there is without <laughs> so, it. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, just look at this fictional movie world we made up. That proves it. And she's yeah. like, what about the baby rape? Before, <laughs> jingly. <laughs> well, and then she brings up this other issue, which is a, which is one that Christian movies very rarely uh, uh, deal with. She's like, "Well, it, uh, then you're not afraid to die." It's like, "No." She's like, "Well, then why don't you die since your wife and your kid are up there and you love Jesus and you're sure you're going to heaven?" He's like, "Oh, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, right, right." <laughs> Next scene. Yeah, and and so it, the whole cell is like, well, without Jesus, crime is up, you know, like seven, eight <laughs> percent. Right, right. it's, it's been he makes a huge difference. <laughs> Commercial air travel's doing fine, but crime is way up. They really wanted to ask for a fourth movie at this point, so they cut over to dying teenager <laughs> yes. girl, and she's woken up, and she's going to speak entirely in vagaries and prophecy and Rebus uh. puzzles. 
Yes. No, and her delivery is like every word she's farting as she says it. She goes like, there's a you know, gold and something in it. Yes. Endless fire and it, dragons. And it, like, just seriously, go watch that. She so literally is farting on every they're, word. They're about to pray for her and she goes, no, pray for Josh. Jesus told me he's very important. And I wrote in my notes, it's weird that Jesus seems to have only confided in teenage girls when the rapture happened. <laughs> it was a strange choice. If there wasn't grass on the field, Christ teenage. wanted to play ball. Yeah, yes. I've seen a pattern emerge here. Yeah. Uh, and so she, she makes her little prophecy, which is, I quote, a hammer, a witness, a man in white, a moving city, the golden bridge, the spire, the throne of light, a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> like you, you missed your broken spear, but other than that, you nailed oh, it. Oh, broken yeah. spear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your broken spear. <laughs> <laughs> your partridge in a pear tree. Uh. She learned that from the voiceover people from the first Oh, movie. right. I see. <laughs> the Scottish family that taught uh, Kevin how to do his Australian accent. And did anyone write down all these objects or what? Like, no one's going to remember all that. I've watched this twice. I don't remember a single thing she said. Like, no one's writing that yeah. down? Nope. Okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Also, uh, just quick note on the la the end of the scene with David R. White and, uh, Sophia there. Um, I don't know if this is the same for you guys. Did you guys watch, uh, Cinemax Red Shoe Diaries as a child? Was that a thing for anybody? Just me. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know, um, I just, <laughs> but, uh, I never watched Naked Women when this, I was a kid. <laughs> well, there's no Naked Women. This is no, you're right. very <laughs> clearly softcore handjob porn <laughs> that ends this scene. It's just faces and shoulder motion. That's <laughs> all you're watching. <laughs> And, uh, done a lot of that. And a look Brought of vague right disappointment on David A. R. Another White's thing face, yeah. on that scene is at some point in the previous fighting, she's picked up one of those, I painted a slight amount of blood on my cheek and therefore it's cut. Yes. Cuts. Yeah. You know, like, uh -huh. There's a, just a line of, you know, watercolor on her face. And it'll and so stay there for the rest of the Forever. fucking movie. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, I wanted so badly for David A. R. White to do the like lick his thumb and be like, let me just get that. <laughs> okay. You're <laughs> magically not cut. <laughs> So I guess on the uh, God's little rebus puzzle about golden bridges and spires, we're going to pause for a quick break. But before we do, let me give Act 3 the hard sell. Will they rescue the girl in time? You remember the girl from the beginning that got stabbed? Aren't they <laughs> still trying to save her or something? Find out the answers to these questions and more when we return for the unintentionally dark conclusion of The Black Rider, Revelation Road. Okay, guys, we do not have a lot of time at TJ Mad Max, so we're going to have to get our things and leave. Heath, we need some gasoline, so see if those guys on the truck have it over at uh, Things That Burn, Baby Burn. All right, no problem. Are, are they next to Kids, Kids, Kids? No, they moved. They're where hmm. Sharp Stuff for Your Car used to be. Oh, shit, did, uh, hmm. did Sharp Stuff for Your Car go out of business? Yeah, they got eaten. Ah, oh, that's too oh. bad. Mm. Great. Um, all right, Eli, you head over to Unlabeled Cans Bonanza. And remember, guys, if you get lost, meet, meet at the, the pit, pit of endlessly burning, burning fires. fires. Yeah. God, I know. No, I want to understand. Will you teach me everything from the beginning? Well, all right. In the beginning, God created the heavens and... Four hours later. Fuck, this book is boring and stupid as shit. What chapter are you on? Chapter one. <sighs> Quick, can you save her? Everybody out of the room. Get this jacket out of the way. Sure, no problem. I'm going to need some rubbing alcohol, some Vaseline, and some rubber gloves. All right, got it. Okay, take her pants off. Uh, um, she, she got shot in the arm. It's, yeah. Uh, I just, I just don't understand. How, how is taking this teenage girl's pants off going to help with the stab wound? It's. Oh, I I'm not a doctor. Wait, wait, you're not? Nope. So why did why'd you, oh yeah yeah you want in on this tag team yeah and we're back for more walking apparently when we last left our heroes they were in no particular hurry to get to the apocalypse flea market and when we return we learn that nothing has changed apparently yeah. Uh, they're walking along, and this is where we learn that so many people think that when everyone turned into power pellets, it was a solar flare. <laughs> and I just wrote in my notes, why does every Christian movie think we'll think it's a solar flare? What about right? us makes people think that we're going to think people vanishing is a solar yeah, flare? Yeah, yeah. Can you name the last solar flare? Is that something you... Yeah, oh, it's all the time. Solar <laughs> I, flares. I can't name the last solar flare that made people disappear. <laughs> <laughs> 
Right. And I also love it during this scene, his Bible is sticking out of the top of his backpack. So <laughs> yeah, like, just in case he draw. needs to whip it out. <laughs> yeah, right, I guess. And, and also, she drops the boyfriend comment here, like, way late. <laughs> way, they, they clearly, like, didn't fuck her hand job, whatever, like, the night before, and she did not comment. She's like, oh, I have, yeah, my boyfriend and me were, <laughs> yeah. you know. It was so quick that all of a sudden I have a boyfriend, and then she gives the, gives the whole, well, teach me then line again. And then he, I guess he does at right. this point, like agree. Okay. Now I'll teach you the secrets of Jesus. She's like, what does it say in your book? He's like, that I can rape you for 50 shekels. Right. He takes out the Bible and she goes, what does it say? And I wrote in my notes, bats or birds. That's what it says. <laughs> well, well, right. And notice in this scene how deep into the Bible he has to open to read her a good part. <laughs> yeah. His cake goes all the way to like Matthew or something like that. He's yeah, like, it's not like you can start with in. page one. Yeah. He tries to get away with like, oh, I'll just find a good line from later. On. She's like, oh, I don't get it. Let's start from the beginning. He's like, oh, fuck. Okay. Oh, right. damn it. But this is essentially him admitting the whole thing makes no sense because she says, teach me to believe. And he's like, well, I can't really, I mean, I could tell you what it says in here, but it's kind of, you have to do the rest. <laughs> and she's like, what does it say? And I, I feel like he should say, oh, you don't want to know. Just, you know what? Just, you don't want to know. Just believe. You don't, don't read the, just. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just says, three hours later. Yeah. And she's like, wait. Who begat Lamech? <laughs> I had the same thing. They had to cut away after he read the first good sentence because it would have cut to her three hours later being like, oh my God, this book is fucking boring. Yeah, it just cuts <laughs> back to the meme where there's skeletons like still holding the book. Or whatever. Yeah, right, right, exactly. Well, because then, yeah, because they, they cut away from the scene with him like reading from the beginning and then they move ahead. Like they cut immediately to he's got that he's put the book away and now he's just making shit up. And I'm like, that's how much of that book you can read mm -hmm. on a fucking movie before it's like okay yeah no that doesn't none of that makes any fucking sense at all um but eventually they they get enough jesus shoehorned into that uh scene to let us move to the next action sequence which will happen at the flea market to the music that arnold schwarzenegger <laughs> masturbates to yeah i wrote music notes the robots are marching <laughs> Once again, right. more strictly one at a time fighting. One at a time, everyone. Do not no more than one at a time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I I want to point out too that it in none of these fight scenes do we ever see David A. R. White make two consecutive motions in a single cut. <laughs> like even when he spins around, just spinning around, you get two cuts of the spin around. <laughs> That's totally true. <laughs> Uh, also, by the way, one of the guys he fights here is fantastic. He has literally a Flintstones tomahawk <laughs> as his weapon. He has, like, seriously, it's the knee hammer the doctor had for reflexes on the Flintstones, and he's fighting him with it. It's fantastic. It's just a triangle rock taped to a stick. Where's his backstory? <laughs> <laughs> More interesting than this one, I'm sure. So now Sorbo is Scottish. Um, he comes out of his tent where he was clearly blowing the big guy. He's wearing knee pads, okay? He walks out of a fucking tent, just him and the big guy. He was clearly blowing the big guy in there. Um, and then he sends the big guy to take care of, um, David A.R. White. And, and by the way, from Scottish, he then transitions to, I believe, Portuguese, mm -hmm. and then he's from Brooklyn, <laughs> yep. and then he was Scarface. Yeah. At yeah. one point, in his accent, he said, this is the worst accent anyone's ever done. At one point, he said territories. The word territories as territories. Like, just for no <laughs> reason. <laughs> like, what? What, what, what is what? that? <laughs> and, and then he closes it with a Mr. Miyagi accent. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. The range on this guy. Now, he, and he, and he pulls out the Mr. Miyagi once, uh, his big henchman or whatever has subdued David A.R. White again. He lost a fight sufficiently for him to offer to trade Sophia for the car, which right. honestly, that's a great deal. Sophia is not worth a car. I'm <laughs> sorry. Yeah, not even a little. Like a fucking pinto. <laughs> um, but, but he won't trade Sophia away. So they decide instead he's going to do post-apocalyptic fight club against the three least threatening people you could possibly <laughs> imagine. They all have... So basically, he agrees to fight Kevin Sorbo's gang, 
and yeah. they all mm-hmm. have normal outfits except they're wearing blankets on their shoulders. <laughs> yep. One of the guys is literally just a bandana over his face <laughs> yep. with sunglasses and a chain around his neck. <laughs> yes. And it's like, what time, you know, what time does Fight Club start? Well, whenever they need it to in the movie. Like, exactly now is when Fight Club was scheduled. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Basically, generally, whenever a guy comes in and tries to take the car, and yeah. uh, looks pretty, uh, looks like he can fight people one at a time. So he fights a bunch of plus size Abercrombie mannequins. <laughs> and, that was Every fun. single fighter swings his fist like three feet above David A.R. White's already ducking head. <laughs> just maybe don't do yeah. that. Maybe swing a little lower. It's the seventieth time that he just easily ducks below a ten foot punch. Like, uh if you watch this fight scene, you would think that David R. White's superpower is to make people think he's three feet taller yeah. than he is. <laughs> <laughs> and the sound effect of the punches that are not landing, by the way, but the sound effect of these punches anyway, it might as well be the same as the, the giant hammer from part yeah, two. Right. <laughs> Long, bonk, bing. <laughs> well, yeah, and you get bing, a big, like, miss. not only the punch sound, if, if a punch lands, but you get, like, the swing sound, which is... Whoa, you know when you, sw- you, sw- yeah, you right. punch, right? <laughs> when you swing your the fist, the Wolverine goes, berserker yeah. attack noise. And while Sophia is watching this, she is soaking wet. Sophia oh, is yes. watching this, so more aroused than me Multiples. watching three thirteen-year-olds chicken fight in a pool. Like there is no <laughs> comparison. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Not until they put that video of that guy cutting his balls off with scissors on the internet have has anyone been so aroused as me oh, and Sophia. I have nowhere to go I from know. this. Yeah, Can so we okay, stop? so he fights <laughs> <laughs> oh, another break. We're gonna take yeah. another break. We're just gonna right? make up. Can a you new write another interstitial just just to we just I, gotta get out of this? <laughs> just to give Thomas time to recover. <laughs> right. Me and Thomas are gonna watch that video during the break. Oh, of course. So one at a time he takes care of the not particularly intimidating guys that he already beat earlier. Um, and then Sorbo decides to change the deal and make him fight the big guy at the end after he's already fought these other guys. And that's not fair. Yeah. Well, and what what we've learned is if you're about four inches taller than everyone, you are invincible. Like it doesn't the yeah. big guy is it doesn't matter how big you are. Uh, David A.R. White punches him in the face and the guy doesn't move. His face doesn't move. Like he takes a full, yeah. <laughs> he, he doesn't react. He doesn't even grin, grimace. He's just like, no, I don't, I don't recognize your punch. <laughs> I, I refuse <laughs> to acknowledge your punch. This is a movie trope, but it's also, it's especially badly done here. The like, if you're tall enough, no amount of, yeah, cause yeah. he also takes a pipe and hits yeah. him in the head and that <laughs> yes. multiple times. He's fine. And also, I'm sorry, is the good guy supposed to pick up a pipe first? Yeah, yeah, I'm is unclear that, on I, the I, weapons I, rules, because actually one of the earlier guys <laughs> had a chain, and it's like, oh, you can just have a chain? What are the... What are the rules of this fight club? I know we don't like to talk about fight club, but like, what are the rules beyond that? Because then, at some point in the fight with the giant invincible guy, there's a table full of weapons that are like barbed wire and like all this shit. That, could they have used those the whole time? I don't understand. Well, and that's the thing too, is he walks up to a table filled with like spiked maces yeah. and he picks up a pipe. <laughs> He picks up like a fly swatter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he realizes none of that's going to work. So it's time for kick you in the ankle over and over again. <laughs> Low leg kicks and then followed by the uh the phone pole bullfighter yeah, yeah, trick. Yeah. He discovered this was the one guy not wearing shin pads. And he's like, oh, shit. No, we all supposed to wear <laughs> oh, shin yeah, pads. <laughs> this is why. <laughs> the human body's biggest weakness. <laughs> And also, of course, this is where he notices that belt face man is about to stab Sophia, but he has to like line his knife up menacingly for several right. minutes. <laughs> yeah, he's got to make sure he, he's calibrated the knife. He's like turn, mm, turning the dials on the yeah. knife. Should I stab her now? <laughs> Let me aim it a little bit more. I think right. I'm going to stab her with a seven. I'm going to stab her with a seven. <laughs> yeah, let me dial it down. I'm going to sharp it. Yeah. Sharpen it first. Yeah, right. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Sorry, I just realized we skipped over the most important scene in the movie, which is before this fight scene, Kevin Sorbo comes up to David R. White and says like, hey man, so you feeling good for this fight? And he's like, and then David R. White goes, 
where's your accent? And he goes, oh, I don't have an accent. I was the drama coach at the community college. <laughs> yeah. I'm betting that's a late ad yeah. to the script I there. Sw- I was going to say that exact thing. This was like at a certain point, the director's like, we can't have this accent. Just we need to come up with a <laughs> way. To write this your out accent of- is so bad. Just cut this in. Like, just cut it in somewhere that this is fake. Yeah, we already filmed all of those scenes at the, at the farm, right. and we're not going back. Which made so. me realize that Kevin Sorbo and David R. White are probably acting rivals in some way. Because I could see the two actors, like David R. White, being like, I'm actually being really serious right now, Kevin. So if you could, like, stay in character. And Kevin was like, I was Hercules. <laughs> Remember when I was in real movies and TV? <laughs> like, you were a secondary character on Evening Shade. Come on, bro. <laughs> normal people have seen me. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> they know my name and everything. I was a drama coach. People love an accent. Want to see the accents I can do? I'm going to do them in your movie. And he was like, don't, Kevin. Just do a normal voice. I'm doing one. I'm doing an accent. So you've got to write a whole scene about how cool my accent is. Sorry, I just needed to mention that. No, yeah, yeah. We, we definitely didn't want to pass through that. So he throws a hammer and knocks out Scarface. Yeah, exactly. And then he jumps Scarface. in the car. And uh, Kevin Sorbo's like, you're not going to make it very far without these keys. But luckily, he has a secret hotwire box in his car. Those are useful. Yeah. You want to keep those handy. Because, you know, to hotwire a car, you just put two wires together. Like your car. Oh, yeah. Is- <laughs> Any two wires will no, do. No, you just blow dry with a hair dryer the whole thing. You just heat up all the wires <laughs> and you're good. Yeah. You have to put a book in it to keep the cartridge down sometimes. But, yeah. So, unfortunately, though, they make their getaway, but there's not enough gas to get all the way to wherever the fuck they're going. So they have to pull over to the side of the road. This time, there's not even a thing. No. This time, he's just pulling over because he likes to do that. Yeah, out of habit. Right. Oh, oh, shit. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, sorry. I'm just so used to pulling <laughs> right. they, over. Are we not they doing pull that over now? and she's like, why? And he's like, oh, we're leaking fuel. But... Where did that schizophrenic guy say we were supposed to be? And she was like three miles that way. And he's like, huh? Yeah, lucky. right. It's convenient that everything's so centrally located in post-apocalypse desert scape world. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. And then also, okay, so th- th- this is also where he goes like, because the bad guys are following him in their Humvees because God damn it, they're going to get some use out of those Humvees. And he's like, basically, he's like, you know what? Fuck all this Jesus nonsense. I just happen to have this gigantic Gatling gun in my trunk. I'm going to shoot him with this. And my music note for this scene is someone's trying to convince David R. White not to shoot Kevin Sorbo. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was for the less, less than the price of a cup of coffee. You could save this puppy. So, yeah. I wrote, she- I wrote, I wrote I'm really glad they made the Children's Aid Society. <laughs> right. <laughs> really glad so she's basically giving him the there's always a better speech or always a better way speech that he gave her earlier. So he thinks better of it and decides not to shoot him, which is great because it turns out that they're invisible at the moment. Because there's a homeless black man peeing behind him. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote, Ooh, how is works. homeless Jesus there? Um, not quite, not quite. But yeah, apparently he had lent, lent his invisibility cloak powers to the black guy. So they just drive by and they're like, can they not see us? And I'm like, that is the weirdest fucking thing for you to think at this point. It must, like, the more logical thing would be like, I guess they didn't care too much about us. Because we literally don't matter to the plot. Yeah, right, right. They must have been (laughs) going elsewhere or something. But yeah, now a black guy in a white snuggie shows up and offers to take him to the shepherd. It could not more clearly be a blanket. There is nothing <laughs> in this world or the next that is more clearly a blanket than what this man is wearing. He's wearing just a normal Brooks Brothers, like Brooks Brothers weave wool sweater and mm-hmm. khakis and a blanket. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Why is he wearing a blanket in the desert? We don't, we don't worry about things like that. Um, the important thing though is that we have an opportunity to get more walking, so we do. And they walk to the compound of the shepherd, and the compound of the shepherd, we're supposed to know it's different because they have apples and bread and yeah. smiles. Yeah. smiling. Right. No, in the end times, Christians are going to start a Whole Foods, a big vegan. Right, right. <laughs> well, all- These people, they, they might as well have cornucopias with baguettes sticking out of the top <laughs> walking around. Yeah, I was just thinking every every actor's internal monologue was, boy, do we have a lot of different fresh produce here. I can't even eat all this delicious, godly, fresh fruits and vegetables that we have here. 
<laughs> hey, do you want a bowl of grapes? Yeah, I'll, t- I'll trade you for those delicious apples and peaches and other things. I also love it. I'm sure the vegan in the audience was having a blast with this one, too, and they're all sitting down for their for their meal, and it's just like an apple sitting on the plate and a few grapes <laughs> sitting on the plate. Like, yeah. You know you can make foods with fruits and vegetables, too, right? Yeah, I'd hate to see the toilets at that compound. <laughs> no. Jeez, they're just yeah. a plate of trail mix. <laughs> they, bring a, they bring over a bowl of grapes, and she goes, I thought grapes had died out. This is supposed to be two years after two the apocalypse. Two fucking years! Why would grapes have died? Go on, what are you talking about? Well, there's no electricity. Uh, there's no electricity in a lot of places, so you can't that. get grapes without power. Yeah, well, but the, the lesson is if they're all nice to each other. So you see, if you're just nice, then food. Then grapes, That's how that, grapes are yeah, alive. You just, yeah. If you're, yeah. Right. So they go with the black guy into what could not more clearly be... <laughs> A Home Depot gardening department. <laughs> the flowers still have the fucking Same sticks note. in them. They yeah. still yeah. have the sticks to show you what I saw. They I are. swear I saw one barcode sticker on one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they're growing they're growing a bunch of flowers. I'd have gone with food myself, but well, you know, whatever. And then this girl walks in to ask George, who is the black guy, if he can help save her plant. And the only reason I mention that is because she is the squeakiest human being on the face of the earth. Oh, Winnie yeah. Cooper. Yeah. Well, early yeah. early Winnie Cooper, right? That's her. Yeah. yeah, and she says she says, Can you help my plant? I've tried everything. So you watered it? Like yep, that's <laughs> oh, it. Oh, I tried band aids. I tried CPR. I, I tried gave it antibiotics. It. I put them in a pile <laughs> yeah. next to her. Yeah, uh, I put a pile of pills next to <laughs> it. I <laughs> tried sleeping with it. I guess just everything. <laughs> So, yeah, so, like, the shepherd magically heals the girl's plant or whatever, and they're like, hey, can you do that even with, like, stabbed girls from Act 1? He's like, yes, but first we must discuss my backstory. Right. And his backstory <laughs> is he was in a coma from his <laughs> life of crime. Well, he yeah. says, yeah, a crime <laughs> coma. I get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happened. He's one of those drugs, crime, prison comas. That's what Christians think comas are. Like, <laughs> oh, he was just so bad and evil <laughs> sinning that he God just slipped into off. a coma. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which means that he woke up with these powers, and that means Jesus was like, you know what? I'm going to use this rapist as my shepherd. This or drug addict <laughs> prison rapist. Yes. <laughs> And apparently he has now Jesus memories. He remembers all the stuff that happened to Jesus. Um, and he needs Josh's help to follow God's call. This is when we learn, holy shit, he's one of the fire-breathing Jews. He's a fire-breathing Jew! He ne- we never get to see him breathe fire. But he Maybe doesn't breathe fire! That. What the fuck? <laughs> right? He never breathes fire. It's very disappointing. He does give someone Wait, an ice cream headache. is this a spoiler headache. Is this a spoiler from later in the Bible that I haven't gotten to? Uh, yeah, whoa, shit. Yeah, yeah, man. Revelations. Come on, there's, guys. There's, there's you a, ruined it for there's me. A oh. few, there's a few references to that in this movie, I do believe. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. I feel like they should have made him breathe fire. I mean, they, had that, they had that bazooka effect from the... Oh, eh, yeah, yeah, right. They had oh, the effect. Oh, they had a lot of great, great CGI to use. Right. Whatever. By the way, music note for this scene, the sun sets over Grandpappy's grave. Yeah, right. <laughs> So what he needs Josh's help to get him to the Holy Land. And and so so Josh says, do you want me to take you to the Holy Land? He's like, oh, hell no. We don't have the budget for that. Just drop me off at the coast. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, wait, yeah. They're you're out Montana. west. Yeah, right. Like the coast, <laughs> that's away from the Holy Like, Like, are you asking him to take you all the way to the East Coast? That's a lot different. Anyway. Yeah, and he says, he says... Oh no, just get me to the, to the coast. God will provide me safe passage from there. It's like, why can't he just do the safe passage for the whole way? Yeah, right. safe, he, he can't, he's like, no, I have to get there that myself. It's a deal we have yeah. with exactly. the travel agency. No, I got a piece of ice. Pay. I can it's only like a copay. It's a 10% it's cool. copay. Yeah, it's, yeah. When you go on a cruise, you have to fly to the cruise. It's like that. Like he has to get there. <laughs> So they walk outside and apparently time fat passes very quickly when you're talking to Brother George? Yeah, he's like a black hole. No, I'm sorry, an African-American hole. <laughs> <laughs> but they need to do that in post because he comes out and it's exactly the same brightness as it was. Oh, right. And he just says, 
what time is it? Like he's confused. I, I, I could, had no idea what he was talking about because it was just as sunny. And the guy's like, oh yeah, it's about, the sun's about to set. It's fucking high noon. The lighting, it's so dumb. Now, and, and keep in mind that so far in this day, they've like gone to the bazaar and he did the big fight club thing and then they walked all the way here. <laughs> so yeah, right, right. It should be the next day of Nice time little Saturday. Passed. They went to Home Depot even. <laughs> yeah. They really did. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Home Depot was still open so you can tell by <laughs> right. their hours. And then yeah. uh, then the Asian guy pulls out this tracker from the car, and he's like, hey, what's this tracker? And then immediately the bad guys are there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, by the way, um, Zach Morris used that exact same tracking device on Mr. Belding in oh. uh, season yeah. four, I believe. <laughs> it's only one. slightly less subtle than the one that Batman used in Batman versus yeah, Superman. Yeah, right, 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 exactly. So then Mr. Clean shows up for the shepherd. He's like, I, uh, the shepherd runs up. He's like, I'm here. I surrender. And I've gotten my notes. Breathe fire. Breathe fire. Breathe fire. We know. <laughs> Oh, you can. We've seen this in other apocalypse movies, you son of a bitch. But he doesn't. He doesn't. No, he, makes us he doesn't. It's very upsetting. And then Mr. Clean shoots Josh twice and he dies. He shoots him in the chest and Josh does this like, must unshoot myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the poor mechanic. I felt really bad for that guy. Oh, they yeah, shoot him too even... and fuck that guy. <laughs> right. We don't even give a shit about yeah. that. Yeah. Now, of course, the shepherd can heal people, so he, like, leans down, and we're like, oh, he's going to heal Josh, but instead he just says, have faith in God's plan, and then he, and then, and then he leaves. That's what the, that's what the, uh, co- like, con artist, uh, cult leader says when shit starts hitting the fan. Oh, no, this, this is all fine. Just, uh, it's fine. Just God's plan, just whatever, I'm out of here. Plan. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Give me your last few dollars, and I'm, I'm just out of here. I'll be out of your way, but trust God's plan. So then we cut to, uh, Mr. Drake, um, tearing more pages out of bibles apparently now they have the shepherd chained to the forklift like jesus <laughs> i just wanted one of the henchmen to be like uh we use that forklift Wait, this is a working <laughs> henchman warehouse where do you think where do you think all this money comes from we're moving boxes around the ulc it was like come on man we should just install some shackles at this point if we've got to chain two people to the forklift in three days obviously we just need shackles can we just get a second one at least a second forklift then yeah right. so- <laughs> and so basically we now cut to David R. White, who wakes up next to uh, Homeless Jesus from movies one and two. Yeah, Charlie Jesus, yeah. Yeah, Charlie <laughs> Jesus. And I, I wrote in my notes here, I realized Charlie Jesus looks like an escort bad client list just came to life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so he basically, he turns to Jesus and he's like, oh, Shepherd heals me. And he's like, no, no, God did it. <laughs> yeah, like, right. Okay, right. <laughs> whatever, man. You're kind of, you're kind of bitchy about that. And now we have the weirdest scene ever because he turns to him and he goes, if you take my hand, you can go to heaven. And David R. White is like, no, the people need me. And he's like, no, it doesn't matter. No matter what you do, it yeah. will not make any difference. The prophecy will come true. There's you are completely no useless. You're the useless. story doesn't matter. And, and David R. White's like legitimately pissed. He's like, wait, now you want to take me to heaven? I obviously can't. You You keep... Killing teenage girls, like stabbing them, and shooting them for me, yeah. that's, to, to get me into. The and the guys like, oh, I, I, I know, I knew, very good. I was <laughs> asking you. Yeah, I didn't forget. I didn't forget. They still relate to the plot. We're gonna get back to that. I love when he's having a conversation with the all-knowing God who created everything and knows what. Like my conversation, if that were me, would just be. Okay, just tell me what to do. Just tell me the... I think I'd ask what the fuck is up with fleas. That would be my first question. Yeah, yeah. He knows everything. Just be like, what do you want me to do? Just, you know the perfect thing to do. I'll just do that. What is... Why are you fucking toying with me? Like, just tell him whatever. (laughs) I'll do whatever. Like, it's so annoying. He's all knowing. Why is he going... Why is he asking him questions and like... Oh, you're getting warmer. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So, so yeah. But but what we're supposed to learn here is that David A.R. White has the choice to go to heaven and be with his wife and his kid or to stay on the earth and help more people find Jesus in the end times. Right. And and instead of taking Jesus' hand, he does like the fake handshake hair smooth thing yeah, to right. Jesus. <laughs> weird choice. No, Jesus. I don't feel like David A.R. White should be taller than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is just me. Like I just I don't know. It just it's weird, isn't it? I like a big Jesus. They did that in Risen, yeah. they got a really tall yeah. Jesus. I like that. I like the North Korean Jesus, the one who was all jacked. I liked him. The pre workout uh, yeah, Jesus. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then remember how I said this guy's actually like sixty and he looks really young? Well, I found out how they did that because when he moves his arms, they're like, it looks like John McCain trying to move his arms and they just bundled him up 
into what looks like a nice, healthy body, but really it's like the Skeksis from the Dark Crystal. Like it's just a bunch of shit bundled up. That's how they did it. Our first Skeksis reference. I love it. Uh, so now we cut to the blockade. Uh, where apparently David A.R. Wedge coming to save the fire-breathing Jew, and I wrote in my notes, now we get to find out if they had the money to run a tow truck into a thing. And they did not. <laughs> they did they not. No, we not. just get a sound effect. We get a sound effect, <laughs> and then we cut, they come down, and the, nothing is damaged. No, no yeah. The right. car is perfect. <laughs> There's not even a scratch at the front. It's just nothing happened. Right. And, and also, I guess what, we're supposed to believe that David A.R. White was in this truck when it, crashed at 90 miles an hour and then snuck out before they could get anyway. But yeah, now he's not in the truck. He sneaks up behind them and just before they can push the you know, gate alarm press in case of good guys button. Press here to foil protagonist in tape. (laughs) Break in case of good guy. Yeah. And um, and so he takes that bad guy out and then he goes to where they're holding the shepherd and counts the bad guys like this is Sesame Street and this Rapture movie was brought to us by the number eight. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah, I I had the same thing of like he counts the bad guys as though that matters somehow. Like whatever it is. He's going to just, oh, he yanked that one down. Yeah, and he right. Was oh, that it's one. good thing and there wasn't 11. Like, Holy shit. That was- yeah, <laughs> it, it could be 400 bad guys. It wouldn't matter. It would just be, okay, I'm behind that one. Now I'm behind that one. <laughs> right. But there's eight. There's eight henchmen spread out all over. <laughs> eight. And, uh, uh, and uh, eight. Uh, <laughs> exactly. And uh, he basically just does one roundhouse kick, and they're all in a pile. Or basically, all of a yeah. <laughs> it's like, like John Hamm. He gets them all with stealth grab. <laughs> My favorite is the one where he's beating the guy up, and then a Another henchman comes and and he's like, "Oh, here, help me with this." Like, I, what is like? He's pretending he's one of the henchmen. Yep. And the guy's like, "Sure, what did you want? I wanted sure. you to go to sleep, karate chop." <laughs> <laughs> Which means it's time for uh, David R. White calls out Drake by going, "Drake," <laughs> so we can have a showdown at high noon. Yeah. Yes. To which we, they have the least interesting gunfight ever. It's just, they're just running around the car. It's like nine year olds playing paintball. Right. And just, there's random <laughs> bullet holes appearing and then disappearing because the after effects wears off. <laughs> oh yeah, that, that thing, exactly, where you hit a window and it just goes pachink and that's it. Yeah, like, it just makes a, a black sound hole like in a... the window. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. then the, everyone runs out of bullets, so it's time for Vincent D'Onofrio to fight David R. White. And so Vincent D'Onofrio gets a machete? <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a machete versus an unloaded shotgun, yeah. He makes sure to swing it a good seven feet above David A.R. White's head. Mm. Good attack strategy. <laughs> Just, oh, I'm going to, I hope you don't jump right when I swing this. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm definitely going to kill you. But David R. White's smart. He does the log roll dodge at that point. So he's oh extra down low. <laughs> Extra down low with the log roll dodge. And then he does a log roll attack as well. That is is literally a Charlie Chaplin fight move. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I thought that something was on fire and he was just stop, drop, and roll. (laughs) And then he just, he feebly rolls toward Mr. Clean and Mr. And that somehow causes him to trip. In real life, he would have just like landed on his shins and be like, what were you doing? What did you think that was going to (laughs) do? Chop you up with his sword now that you're laying on the ground and front of yeah. me, yeah. David R. White has the same special moves as Voldo from Soul Calibur. It's fun. <laughs> a little bit of Vega in there, too. <laughs> and then he finishes him off with a arm bar submission where Mr. Clean just falls asleep. To, That's how it works. If you death. arm bar submit <laughs> right, a guy, yeah, but they just go, Ugh. breaks his arm to death. Yeah, yeah, right. The guy <laughs> yeah. dies because of this. And I loved the moment where he's trying to get into the, into the <laughs> arm bar. Right. <laughs> David R. White just like slowly maneuvering his crotch into Vincent D'Onofrio's face with a lot of help. And then yeah, no, well, he's over, like, yeah, no, my, my jujitsu sensei said, okay, I make sure to, he's like, I'm, give me a minute. I want to make sure I get my technique right. He's, he's, looking, looking, at at like, he's here. looking at a cop a black belt magazine as he yeah. does it. He's like holding it up. Yeah, yeah. Hold on, hold on. So, and there's also this one moment there that I absolutely love. Okay, so they, w- while they're having this fight, like basically um, Josh has a shotgun that he's blocking the machete with, all right? And at one point he has to do like sort of a jump shoulder roll kind of thing. But once he does, he obviously cannot get up with both hands still on the shotgun. <laughs> so he so starts cool. to get up, falls backwards, and the shot cuts. And they cut. To so- yeah, to something else. <laughs> that, was- <laughs> that was so good. The whole movie's worth watching just for that moment uh. because they literally had him falling back on his ass there. I want that deleted scene so fucking bad. 
Um, now, okay, so now that Mr. Clean is dead from the arm bar. Yeah, yeah he's submitted to death <laughs> with the arm bar. We get fakey explosion. Because the oh mayor comes out God. with a bazooka. Yeah, right. He's going <laughs> to shoot Dredus. one guy with a bazooka. <laughs> <laughs> and at one point... What you can, he points the bazooka, you can completely see through the chamber. Yes, it's yes. just a tube. <laughs> you get a full view through it. <laughs> and the, the graphics and the blow up are so oh. bad in this scene that the sci fi so channel great. would have been like, come on guys, we can do better. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. right. <laughs> They might as well have just had a guy hold a picture of fire in front of the buildings. Like, <laughs> well, Boom. again, the paper clip came back and was like, oh, I see you want some <laughs> like red explosion clip art. Here, I'll put it here. Yeah. So then the, um, the, uh, like, Sophia escapes, and but he's buried under rubble. Luckily, that doesn't hurt him in any way. The fact <laughs> yeah. that a building exploded on top of him. A building collapsed, and she's like, hey, you okay? And he's like, what did I drink last night? Am I yeah. right? And it's like, <laughs> ah, I expected the studio audience to laugh at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, she, she says, are you in one piece? And I wanted him to just say, like, no, there's another, like, my legs are separated from me. A building <laughs> fell on me. Are you crazy? No, I'm in two pieces. Um, so uh, apparently they're taking uh, the shepherd to the airfield, and now they've got to give chase. Except for there's not a chase scene. They just get in a car, and then you see them showing up <laughs> at, at the airfield. airfield. Yeah. <laughs> they just show up. And the the, uh, the head tattoo people, the L.L. Bean models, get out. Yeah. And Shepard does the like, me, 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 and you think he's going to blow their heads up like scanners. I was like, oh, my God, he's going to blow their heads up like scanners. But instead, they're just like, ow, ow, ow. <laughs> yeah. My he has the power it's to fast. cause slight discomfort to tattoos. That's his power. <laughs> so if the if Satan didn't do the 666 tattoo thing, the bad guys would have won here? Like right, the shepherd yeah. Been, if like yeah. if they brought some antibiotics Mike. for that headache, evil would have prevailed. <laughs> My favorite thing about these guys is they always get out of a plane that was so obviously not just flying. Like oh, it, it, it could not have been more not flying. It's like in a weird corner of the runway. There's no room. There's no way I could have landed there. It's so funny. Yeah, yeah, and, and and I'm thinking that we get the exact same plane in all the Christian movies, too. Yep, Creflo Dollar's old plane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he upgraded. So we cut back to the sick girl, and again, this entire movie has been about Ugh. healing this fucking teenager. And the shepherd's over her, and he's like, did you heal her? And he's like, nope, sorry, no more <laughs> healing. <laughs> well, yeah, no, he's like, well, the rest is up to her. And then, then we cut and she's talking to Jesus and she's like, nah, I don't want to live. Never mind. Right. What the fuck? The whole movie was this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh. she's talking to the fucking Charlie Jesus that fondles undropped testicles. Dude, this guy is so not Jesus. Yeah. And, uh, and Skeksis Jesus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Nice. Bringing Skeksis back. Um, then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> bringing <Skeksis> back. <laughs> so then, um, yeah, so the little girl's talking with Jesus and she's like, he's like, well, if you want, you can just go to heaven and be with your family and everything, or you can stay here in post-apocalypse hellscape. And she's like, no, I think I want to You want to hang out with my family. He's like, okay. And, and there's literally a moment where she goes, will they be okay? And he goes, who cares? Let's go to Big Rock Candy Mountain. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Should they? everyone just be hoping they die? Like, what? I think Jesus lets her in on the secret. Like, no, you don't have to stay here. You could just die. And she's like, oh. Oh, I can just that's die? Oh, better. okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> and, yeah. And what of, are we doing here? One of his exact lines, he goes... These end times are hard yeah. times. Damn it. <laughs> Try not to say time again. I have, I, that, uh, son of I have that totally in my notes. Same exact like these hard, these end of times are hard times. Yeah, you caused it. You did it, dude. <laughs> yeah, like, you dick. <laughs> yeah, but like, okay, but like the girl died. Everything was useless. There were never uh, any stakes in this movie. No, they were not. And to really double down on that, for the finale of this oh. movie, we cut to them at the coast, wherever the fuck that is. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Look like Lake Michigan, yeah. And he and Sophia have the most boring, less interesting conversation you could possibly imagine, yeah. where he's basically like, stay with me. And she's like, go with me. And he's like, stay with me. And they're like, all yeah, right, Yeah, they couldn't come it. up with any reason. <laughs> no! So they're both like, they're both like, oh, I feel like I should go. And then he's like, well, I feel like... I I should stay. So, so there's our conflict, everybody. That's we, kinda, our I kind of, I, <laughs> yeah. Nick can't, Nick, not a single reason. Just, uh, I kind of think, no, I kinda, I'm not going to go. Like, yeah, because she's like, well, why do you have to go? She's like, I feel like I need to see this through. 
that's it. Yeah, that's, that's okay. It. Fine. Why doesn't he feel like he needs to see it through? They could just as easily. <laughs> and the guy already told us that God was going to give him safe passage from here. So there's that. Right but. on a on an inexplicable cargo ship with an inexplicable captain. They just say like, yeah, ocean. we came to exactly the ocean. Like that's where we went. <laughs> we went to the ocean, and there was just a cargo ship somehow. There was just a sea <laughs> like, captain wandering we, we the We hailed beach. it like a cab. <laughs> At first, at first we were invisible and they kept passing us and we didn't know what was going on. I thought it was because I was black, but no, we were invisible. <laughs> but then I thought, then I thought, oh, maybe it's from one of the countries that has like zero Christians. So for them, everything's fine this whole time. Oh, right, like, right. No one yeah. got raptured. The government's exactly the same. It's all intact. And it's like, yeah, we're just trying to do some commerce here. What's going on over here? <laughs> so yeah, so they leave and then he goes back up to his car where he finds Dun, the boss <laughs> sitting <laughs> on the car. He goes, Josh McManus, you're a hard man to find. Remember me? I was in the first two. You remember, I had a change of heart at the yeah, end. I kind of want to be in part four. <laughs> we can set this up now. Well, my theory was David A.R. White wanted him to be in the whole movie, but he's like, dude, I, I have a life, man. I can't just do infinite of the same movie over and over you like sure? you can. I Because I, I can do infinite of the same movie. <laughs> no, no, I'll just, I'll, I can come in for the last two seconds, but I'm oh, not going to do this again. Deal. Man. We've done it. We, we did this movie deal. already. Are you really still making, I thought it was kind of funny on the first one, but God. Deal. You have a deal. So with the promise of a uh, buddy cop post-apocalyptic Boz and David A.R. White team up in uh, part four, I guess we're going to wrap that one up. But I, I wanted to finish the trilogy off with a little bit of a best of. Uh, so I have a couple of questions here. And if you guys don't mind, I'd like you to consider all three films when answering these questions. All right. So all right. my first one is, which was the best fight scene? Uh, uh, I got to right. go with the slap fight in the hotel room from movie <laughs> number one. All right. All right. Uh, I'm going to go car versus motorcycle plus hammer. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. That's one of my good favorites. One. Yeah. Oh, you took all the good ones. I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with feeble barrel roll. <laughs> scene. God, so good. Just I'm going to go with, yeah, the fight move that was, ah, my heart. I fell down on the ground and rolled slowly and you tripped for some reason. <laughs> All right. And I have a sneaking suspicion that everybody may have the same answer for this one. But what was the best David A.R. White could not possibly look less badass scene? Ooh. Uh, oh. Tramp stamp. Tramp stamp scars. <laughs> Ooh, tramp stamp scars is good. I was going to go with uh, David R. White takes off his burqa. To, because he's about to go shoot those very clearly <laughs> white guys at the base in movie two. Oh, all right, all right, that's a good one. Uh, I'm going uh, th this movie when uh, he's he's doing the the arm bar on Walter White's brother in law, but <laughs> but he can't. He's just flailing around with his legs, guys to help him, and, and the guy's like, "Okay, I'll just die." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, if you don't mind. He clearly can't do this arm bar. I'll just die. Yeah, See, I was sure everybody was going to go with the unveil scene. I wait where they where they had him behind the plastic. I I, I thought for sure. Oh, oh that's, yeah, that's a good a, one. I, I was expecting either one. that or the where he first walks out in the chartreuse blouse in the, oh, in the second one. Oh, that one's one. good too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's so many. There's you so can't, many. It's impossible. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and uh, which moment made you guffaw the loudest? Uh, Kevin Sorbo dropping the accent and saying he's a drama teacher. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it was definitely the half second late bink noise of the hammer. <laughs> definitely, and all the punches that missed. This is a, this is an unanswerable question. You cannot. There's just. It's like if someone asks you, "What's the biggest shit you took your whole life?" I don't know. May third, nineteen ninety nine. I would have to say, you no, know, well, that was mine. You were telling me mine. Wait, were you there? No, I'm just kidding. I would have to say it's the the bazooka. It was just so amazing. It's so incredible. <laughs> the CGI the bazooka, was seriously, so awesome. watch the bazooka scene, everyone. It's it's the best. And for mine, it's a no brainer. It's it's the boss yelling after he builds his hammer. That was <laughs> oh! that was so good. <laughs> That's pretty great. And and finally, which loose thread of the three films do you feel most deserves its own movie? Uh, how tomahawk guy got his tomahawk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go with uh, the Groundhog Day Inception Norman Bates grandma lady that never got explained. <laughs> That'd be a good one. Yeah. At all. The time travel in the movie. Not a big deal. <laughs> Here's how bad these movies are. I don't remember what happened to Dexter's sister. Did... Did, yeah, she just kind of wandered alive? off she, at the end of the second one. Yeah. yeah. She, she, she knew who she was and where she was going. 
She assures yeah, us Yeah, so of I that. guess that? I, I don't know. Maybe that. I mean, nothing deserves its own move. Well, okay. How about the old-timey pirate pistol? I yeah, right. Know where, what, <laughs> what chest... What chest of booty did he find? That, like it was in the costume go, I'll department use at the community college. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Thomas, I think I speak on behalf of Eli Heath and the entire audience when I say we really appreciate you sticking through the whole trilogy with us, and look forward to having you back in the future, bro. Oh, thank you so much. It was a dream come true. I'll see you guys for part four whenever that is, and uh, I it, I can't thank you enough. It was super fun. Awesome. And again, of course, if you want to hear more of Thomas, you can hear him on Comedy Shoeshine, Atheistically Speaking, and Thomas in the Bible, all of which will be linked on the show notes for this episode. Thomas, thanks once more, sir. Thank you. Yeah, if you, I, I recognize you're going to miss me. It's been three weeks together. People get used to people, you know, you're going to, but just, you know, Atheistically Speaking, Comedy Shoosh, that's where you can find me. There you go. And well, that does it for our review of The Black writer we don't know which side of the colon the subtitle goes on that's not going to do it for our episode <laughs> just yet because we still need to tease you a little for next week so eli tell us what's on deck vultures of horror <laughs> and i gotta say it looks like the christians are going to try to outdo international gorilla day <laughs> this looks so fun okay so I, we should note that like as near as we could tell there's not really a trailer there's the beginning of the movie which is sort of the trailer for the movie but so what I did is I just pulled up the it's it's free on YouTube. I pulled it up and watched like three random clips and this is going to be the most boring thing we've ever fucking sat through. Yeah. So there's six of them. We're not going to watch all six in a row <laughs> no, because I no. need to live. I need to live and have a, I can't take my own life this way. That's not how it ends. <laughs> um so we're going to space them out over a lifetime hopefully. <laughs> but this is a Nollywood movie. It's made in Nigeria yeah. and it, it's apparently about According to the YouTube description, it's about two young boys who start to worship Satan and their Christian mother who needs to free them from a witch doctor? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what I saw from the little bits that I watched is it's about two or three people sitting next to each other for extraordinary long periods of time talking. Yeah. I mean, like, there were literally spots where I skipped seven minutes ahead, and it was still the same scene with the same three people <laughs> sitting in the same three positions. Yeah. It looks like it's going to be a blast. But, yeah, we haven't done anything Nollywood before. This should be an interesting uh, endeavor. Yeah. When I searched Google for the trailer, it just said, really? <laughs> are, you, are you sure? I'm feeling lucky. No, you are not. <laughs> Perhaps you should call this number. You need to talk with somebody. Did Vladimir Putin send you? <laughs> So with all that to look forward to, we'll bring episode 36 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Thomas Smith of Comedy Shoeshine and Atheistically Speaking for powering through the entire trilogy with us. And a huge thanks to all the new Patreon donors and the old ones that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to every episode. You can also help us out a ton by leaving us a five-star review on iTunes and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoy the show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist and The Skeptocrat, available on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever else podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail.com. All the music used in this episode was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of Evil Drafts on Mars and was used with permission. If you like what you hear, hear more by following the links on the show notes for this episode. Thanks again for giving us a chunk of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm No Illusions, promising to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. David Sophia and Morpheus in a Blanket were captured by Somali pirates. <laughs> Noah forgot to write this part this week. Sorry. Those two people in the airplane went back to their terrifying LLB catalog that they came from. <laughs> <laughs> there was a happy ending after all. See? Take my hand, and you shall see your wife and daughter again. I wish I could, but they need me here. The shepherd. You are not needed. God will find a way, no matter what. Well... What if I won't want the burden, huh? Well, well, then that's, that's totally fine. Uh, again, as I said, since the prophecy is true, absolutely nothing you do matters. So like, you know, come to heaven, don't, it's, uh, it's up to you. It's all just a, it's a weird puppet show. You do not matter. Nothing you do matters. Heaven. Okay. I'll do it. I'll stay and fight. Nobody cares. You bring your phone everywhere. Work, school, shh, the movies. Now you can bring it to an Xfinity store for an easy way to switch to Xfinity Mobile, a new kind of network designed to save you money. 
You can get up to five lines of talk and text included with Xfinity Internet at no extra cost. So all you pay for is data. It's never been easier to switch to Xfinity Mobile and keep the phone you love. Click here to see how. Sorry, I gotta take this. Restrictions apply. Limited to select mobile phones. Requires activation of a new line of Xfinity Mobile. Up to five devices per account. New Xfinity Internet customers limited to up to two lines pending activation of Internet service.